Introductory Stanzas to Dionysius the Areopagite, with other poems, by Anne Hawkshaw. Read by Phil Benson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dionysius the Areopagite, with other poems, by Anne Hawkshaw. London, Jackson and Walford. 18 St. Paul's Churchyard, Manchester, Sims and Dinham, Exchange Street, 1842. Introductory Stanzas Where are the strains, like solemn music, stealing, which erst from Cambria's ancient valleys came? Where is the heart that shrined all holy feeling? Remains there only now of her a name? Is the lyre broken and the music o'er? Oh, sweeter, never woke the echoes of our shore. And could she not bequeath her gift of song, Treasure far richer than the Indian mine? Could not those mountain winds the strain prolong, Which sweep o'er heights where freedom built her shrine, Or sigh o'er many an elder minstrel's tomb, Free winds that never fanned a conqueror's plume, it may not be on the dead soldier's breast they lay the sword and lance and they have borne her lyre in sadness to her place of rest and for its silence wherefore should we mourn for there are few would listen to the strain were she to wake that lyre's deep chords again this is no time for song there is a strife for wealth or for existence all around and all the sweet amenities of life and all the gentle harmonies of sound die like the flowers upon a beaten path or music midst the noise of toil and wrath oh to awake once more the love of song the love of nature and of holier things than crowd the visions of the busy throng alas the dust is on the angel's wings and those who woke the lyre in days gone by wake it no more or touch it with a sigh Bard of the lakes, is there not yet a tone slumbering within that silent harp of thine? Is there no forest glade, no mossy stone, no quiet lake, no old forgotten shrine, left unrecorded and unsung by thee? Oh, breathe one parting strain of thy pure minstrelsy. Manchester, March the 25th, 1842 footnotes remains there only now of her a name mrs hemans bard of the lakes wordsworth end of introductory stanzas to dionysius the areopagite part one of dionysius the areopagite with other poems by anne hawkshaw this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, Part 1, 1 What more will be thy prey, O thou insatiate time? Which of the earth's bright cities next, The temples of what clime Will thy foot trample into clay, Or touch convert to ruins grey? Thou hast crushed the gorgeous palaces Of Shina's ancient plain, one shapeless mound alone is left, and thou and silence reign. Silence, though broken by the scream of the lone bittern, by that stream o'er which there floated many a tone of revelry in ages gone. All, all at length are thine, city and pyramid and shrine. Like the red simoon's burning blast, thy wing over Mizraim's land hath passed and memnon's harp is silent now strange land of wonders where the dead have silent cities of their own and men of generations fled dwell in their caverned tombs of stone still frail as human works may be they have an immortality that nations know not ages yet shall the dark pyramids arise keeping the secret of their birth neath egypt's burning skies and many an empire pass away, and nations crumble to decay, 
ere their last fragments mix with clay. The shrine outlives its creed. Who piled yon lonely cairn upon the wild? What hands that moss-grown altar placed in the stone circle on the waste? History now darkly tells the tale of bloody rites that there were done by white-robed druids to the sun, and in the forests of the west, that cast their shadows o'er the breast of deep Ontario's lake, or wave, by many an Indian hunter's grave, rise the green mounds of earlier time, the work of nations who are dead, past like the leaves the winds have shed. And still on Grecian hills and plains are roofless temples, priestless fanes, all beautiful, as though decay but touched them with a pencilled ray. So autumn skies give colours bright to forests which they come to blight. The shrines are there, but Dorian flute and Theban lyre alike are mute. The shrines are there, but on that shore the choral hymn is heard no more. The fountain in the Delphian shade may spring, but she, the enchanted maid, who drank its vaporous magic, now sleeps with the nameless dead below. When then shall the penalty be paid that heaven upon thy land hath laid for thy dark deeds? When will arise the day star in thine Asia skies? It shall shine out at length. It dawns already on thy sea-washed isles, where freedom from her ancient heights looks o'er the land she loved and smiles. O oh, phoenix-like, spring, upward spring, with higher flight and stronger wing. Bid all be wise, bid all be free, who tread thy earth, who plough thy sea. Thy chain is burst. O oh, twine not now the nightshade round a sceptic brow. End of part one. Part two of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, part one, two. I love the beautiful where'er it is found in ocean, earth, or air. I love the beautiful in art and music's tones deep joy impart awaking chords that quivering thrill when the sweet magic sounds are still i love the music of the woods of waters and of solitudes the dash of waves along the shore their rushing and their ceaseless roar the murmur low the streamlet makes creeping along through tangled brakes while bearing on with gentle force the fallen rose-leaf in its course I love the wild flower of the glen, and in the crowded haunts of men I can find beauty too, in faith that conquers shame and smiles at death, or when affection mid the strife and weariness and toil of life smiles like a sunbeam on a scene that else had utter darkness been. I love the beautiful, and thou hath beauty, Greece. It lingers still at sunset on each glorious hill, it looks when rosy morning smiles across thy seas and hundred isles but most of all where laurel bowers grow by athena's fallen towers city of temples on whose hill the parthenon looks proudly still spite of the marring touch of time and fiercer grasp of war and crime enough is left to tell how great she was enough to tell her fate land of the myrtle and the rose memory a beauty round thee throws the sage's tomb the patriot's grave the purple seas thy rocks that lave the past hath clothed with beauty caught from daring deed and noble thought and one charm more the last the best on which the christian heart can rest without a sigh through thee first came to europe's shores a saviour's name End of part two. Part three of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Dionysius the Areopagite, Part 1, 3. Breathe softly, tis the choral hymn sung while the evening shadows dim fall on the sleeping city. Low and soft as dew its numbers flow, binding all the listener's soul with mystic but with strong control. The past with all its smiles and tears, the future with its shrouded years, are with us, and alone forgot our present scenes and present lot. There may be mirth when music brings light hearts, young steps around its strings, in gilded hall or courtly bower, but not when heard at evening's hour, and heard alone. Ah, then, along it floats like Perry's sorrowing song, mourning, as eastern fables tell, the paradise from which she fell. It was a Grecian hymn that stole o'er sleeping Athens. Years have gone since the soft music of its tone died on the winds. The voice is hushed, and the lyre broken whence it gushed. Ages of darkness and of gloom, of Greece, have made a living tomb, since that sweet music floated o'er the city of the sunlit shore. Whence came that strain? T'was from a shrine that polished Athens called divine, but on the unwilling ear it fell of one who bowed not to its spell, though he alone was kneeling there and in the attitude of prayer. He yielded not to its control, yet felt that all its sweetness stole upon him. For his lofty mind, the gentle and the stern combined. He had not learned with cynic scorn to view the arts which life adorn, but yet one master feeling kept, strong watch and ward, and never slept. It was no dream of earthly fame, but pure the source from whence it came, a spirit in him urging still to combat with each form of ill, whether in pleasure's guise it came, or in the whirlwind or the flame. Where the cool Sidness rolls its stream, from where the peaks of Taurus gleam, beneath Silesian skies that glow upon its towering heights of snow, he drew his earliest breath, and gave his memory to that crystal wave. Tis more than Greece's classic earth to me, since, Paul, it gave thee birth. He prayed to the moral night, the power that said, Let there be light, and light, like a transparent robe, was wrapped around the new-made globe, again might speak. Around him rose, sleeping in moonlight's soft repose, temple and portico and shrine and columns in their stately line like neolian harp the breeze played softly through the acacia trees its fitful music and that tone the midnight silence broke alone god of my fathers has thy hand thus poured thy blessings o'er this land and yet not one to bend the knee or breathe one earnest prayer to thee burst from paul's lips Around me rise, art's wonders e'en beneath these skies, Where all is wonderful and bright, save man. With him tis night, tis night. He slumbers in the moral tomb, Day-star of nations pierce its gloom. Alone I am, like him of old who stood on Carmel, Calm yet bold among the priests of Baal, Alone God's champion midst his shrines or throne. I stand amid a mingled crowd of men and gods, but solitude with its still voices tells me more of God than doth this peopled shore. Man knows him not, and hath defaced even the land his bounty graced with idle altars. Grot and tree and river have their deity, but what, my God, is given to thee? He ceased, yet sought no couch of rest. Too deep the thoughts that filled his breast. There, through the silent night, he stayed, And by that altar mused and prayed, Till o'er Hymettus's heights the sun rose, And another day begun. End of part three. Part four of Dionysius the Areopagite With other poems by Anne Hawkshaw this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Dionysius the Areopagite, Part 1, 4. Morning broke, with its wonted smile, O'er burnished fane and marble pile, Gilding the Parthenon, till shone its pillars of pentelic stone, Like glaciers on an alpine height, While glittering in the morning light, The helmet of the goddess queen, As far as Sunium's cape was seen, A beacon to the mariner, Guiding his home-bound bark from far, While bearing perfume on its wing, The breeze came o'er those bowers of spring, Those scented bowers, that voice and lute So seldom suffered to be mute. For though beneath the Roman sway Athens was still the vain, the gay, The spirits that on Marathon Looked o'er the field of freedom won, Or pointed with a sorrowing pride To where the Spartan patriots died, then slumbered. She hath woke again, for Greece has snapped the Turkish chain. It could not be that she should sleep for ever by that blood-stained steep. It could not be that never more her voice should wake that silent shore. And while the clouds of slavery hung above her favourite land, she kept long vigils where her heroes slept. Sharing the eagle's rocky height, she mocked from thence the tyrant's might. Albania's mountain children fired, and Sully's softer sons inspired. Altars of liberty are ye, dark mountains, last homes of the free, and there, till brighter days returned, the sacred lamp of freedom burned. That morning woke to care and strife, the pleasures and the ills of life, the crowds of Athens, some to weep o'er languid hopes, or anguish deep, and some, like insect, or the flower, to flutter through life's little hour. Sons of to-day, mere passers-by, light as the clouds on summer's sky, that leave upon the trackless space of the wide heavens, nor sign nor trace. From the Italian shore there came full many a youth of noble name, to learn that tongue, whose gentle flow was like the sound of music, borne o'er waters when the winds are low. And others came to gaze and learn, from chiselled bust and sculptured urn. Some loiter in the laurel bowers, to braid their shining locks with flowers, or, by Elysus's crystal stream, wander to read the poet's dream, or wake the lute, while from the fanes soft voices answered back the strains, from many climes were gathered there the gay, the gifted, and the fair, but like the sisters' flowers they wreathed, they passed, or like the songs they breathed, their very language is no more. The songs that Grecian breezes bear startle the echoes of her shore. Tis not the speech of Plato's tongue, nor that which gifted Sappho sung. Within the forum's spacious square Gather all ranks, all ages there. Beneath yon plane tree's sheltered walk The sons of Epicurus talk, While with cold brow and scornful eye The stoic views the passer-by, Discussing questions wrapped in shade, And by their doubts still darker made, A group assembled. Why, said one, who from his fellows lived alone, why will ye smile when all around is but one vast sepulchral mound? All that we have is for the grave, nor love, nor hope, nor prayer can save. And when a few short years are past, death carries all with murky blasts to darker shores. Nay, rather say, another answered, that the day that hides the body from the light quenches the soul in starless night. "'Tis but a transient spark that dies "'with the last look on these bright skies. "'And they are bright, despite the men "'who in the sun can darkness find, "'or say the shining stars are dim "'when tis themselves are blind. "'Men die, and unto native clay "'nations and kindreds pass away. "'But there arise to fill their place another, "'and as joyful race.' Weepest thou because the winter's blast hath stripped the forest? Wait a while, and the returning spring shall wake its blossoms with a smile. I pluck them smiling while I may, and think not of the coming day. I wreathe them while in beauties bloom, for thee they only deck a tomb. Live for the present hour, 
and leave the future for itself to grieve but mingling with that crowd was one in thought in feeling all alone young yet upon his youthful face deep thought had left its earnest trace he leaned beside a funeral earl and will said he no spring return to wake my spirit from its sleep will death his watch for ever keep plato were all thy dreams in vain bound in his adamantine chain slumbers thy spirit which so high soared even while mortality fettered its wing oh for a voice to break the silence of the tomb or for one ray of light to break the shrouded future's gloom tis broken said a stranger's voice triumphant shall the spirit rise beyond these perishable skies for ever to rejoice the dying struggle parting sigh its heralds to eternity nor shall the body in her cold embrace the earth for ever hold ages may pass yet it shall wake conqueror or death the grave and hell laid down in weakness raised in power amid celestial light to dwell in bliss ineffable so spake the apostle round him stand the learned of that learned land but armed by truth he sees nor hears the idler's laugh the cynic sneers wrapped by his lofty theme on high he reasons for eternity no faltering told of inward doubt but deep and passionate and strong flowed on the tide of eloquence in rapid words along end of part four part five of dionysius the areopagite with other poems by anne hawkshaw this librivox recording is in the public domain dionysius the areopagite part one five there is no ruin old and grey telling of glories passed away a few rude moss-clad stones decay and warfare's rage have left yet there though lone and desolate and bare the rugged hill uprears its head the historic muse its light hath shed and in its loneliness sublime that rock still towers mid wrecks of time for oft in athens early days her purest court assembled there nor did the oppressed breathe in vain for justice an unheeded prayer beneath a rustic roof they sate in moral dignity not state art was not summoned to adorn their lowly seats of simple stone yet with no flattery on their tongue their presence awed a rabble throng and made the guarded despot feel power needed not his bars of steel and there too in degenerate times when the high spirit of the past a parting shadow only cast on the bright land that gave her birth paul stood before that ancient court by those who lately heard him brought and thus he spoke athenians hear i know the unknown god ye fear ye might have spelt his wondrous name from earth and ocean's mighty frame ye might have learned his skill and power from sun from sky from plant from flower the meanest thing which crawls doth grace well its befitting time and place i know from chance ye say they came but see ye now from chance the same see ye from random atoms whirled in giddy dances rise a world as some of those among your wise thought that this earth we tread might rise could chaos bid from out its breast this flower arise in beauty dressed ah see ye not ye need a god each spring to deck the verdant sod a never-ceasing energy to people earth and sky and sea renewing what disease and death have blighted with their withering breath ye might have learned that matter lives and moves when mind the bidding gives and then alone for when the soul escapes at death from its control inert and hastening to decay the body lies a lump of clay this much from nature ye might learn that through her mighty frame 
a power is working ceaseless every hour but answer none can she return from tuneful earth or sounding wave is there a land beyond the grave and will offended justice save ask this and through the silent sky breaks no glad message of reply the sages on whose dust ye tread who held high converse with the dead died doubting whether they should find that brightest vision of their mind that far beyond the darkening west there lay some island of the blest where they immortal good and pure in bliss and glory should endure it was a thought of heavenly birth that crossed their minds not born of earth a lingering record of that truth revealed when time was in his youth and but a single being trod this earth fresh from the hands of god i hear ye say why idly tell the truth our sages knew too well that darkness dwells upon the tomb and faints the light that gilds the gloom because at length have rolled away the shadowing clouds that o'er it lay time shall not ever run his round a trumpet through the heavens shall sound like a burnt scroll shall pass the skies and then the slumbering dead shall rise mock ye the truth he were no god if every footstep that he trod and every portion of his plan your mind could grasp your eye could scan look round it is a mystery all from oceans ceaseless rise and fall to this poor blade of grass what powers reside in sunbeams and in showers from a mean seed to waken flowers no greater wonder in the truth that wakening with immortal youth my mortal body shall arise than in me or around me lies thou livest thine active limbs obey thy will and at its bidding play but how the secret influence works and how on matter acts the mind thou knowst as little as of light can know the blind only believe what thou canst see that only truth that's clear to thee why then thy truth must be a lie to him who cannot soar so high is god thus great it is not then in temples built by mortal men he dwells whom eye hath never seen without a shadowing cloud between think not the uncreated one who dwells in light unseen alone your hands can shape in gold or stone the times of pagan night are past celestial day hath dawned at last and time at length shall fold his wings yon ocean's restless waves be still like blasted figs the stars shall fall the burning sun grow pale and chill then the dark slumbers of the dead shall wake at time's retreating tread and all before their judge shall come to hear their doom, their righteous doom. End of part five. Part six of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, part one, six the voice hath ceased the crowd is gone but he still lingers there alone who asked for one celestial ray to light the tomb around him lay city and island rock and flood beneath that doric temple stood which time relenting of his rage bequeathed to many a distant age temple of theseus not a bone remains of those who hewed thy stone yet fresh as from the sculptor's hand thy stately line of pillars stand the young athenian bent his gaze down on that shrine of other days yes he exclaimed if all of man earth bounds he hath a meaner span than his own works the marble bust lives when the sculptor's hand is dust silent he stood absorbed in thought long had his spirit vainly sought for peace peace with itself and heaven from sages and from nature's voice he asked reply yet none was given 
but the new faith the apostle taught contained each truth his mind had sought yet can he own such truth proclaimed by one whom only scorn had named thoughts too of her he loved found way mid the mixed musings of that day it cannot be at length he said as down he went with hasty tread perish the creed that would divide thy fate and mine my destined bride and yet these thoughts of coming doom hang on my spirits like the gloom of erebus if truth he told twas glorious for away it rolled the shadows of eternity and lighted up its shoreless sea onward he went nor paused till where embowered amid its gardens fair a stoic's mansion stood the home of his betrothed a mingled sound of a sweet voice and silver lyre was floating round sad was the song tis ever so with those who love a shadow lies on the young spirit not of woe but made of gentlest sympathies the heart with all things deep are lying and far from scenes of pleasure flying but there were two within those bowers both beautiful as different flowers myra the loved one light and gay lovely as a sunbeam's prismed ray o'er her fair neck her black hair spread in ringlets from her graceful head pale pearls of ocean lent their aid and bound her arms with costly braid while glittered round her head a band of jewels sought in many a land a thoughtful brow carina thine on which no glittering circlets shine thine was such loveliness as lies in the mild light of evening skies such beauty as awakens thought a beauty from expression caught left orphan in her early years before the loss could wake her tears to share the lovely myra's home the fair and gentle child had come and years of happiness had flown and loved and loving they had grown dionysius came carina gone with myra he is left alone young as she was unused to scan the deeper workings of the man she saw some secret filled his breast or hidden care his heart oppressed o oh, love a look a word a sigh can wake thy fears unconsciously both sunk in silent reverie so deep that from a distant bower they heard carina's voice her song seemed to have syllabled in words the thoughts which he had buried long he listened and once more the strain in soft clear numbers rose again o oh, beautiful art thou luxuriant earth with thy o'erarching heavens and circling seas and yet no gladsome dreams no thoughts of mirth wake in my heart thy many melodies for as we gaze in sadness on a face we love but have to leave tis thus thy charms i trace shall i then perish and in silence lie forgetting and forgotten will no sound of childhood's merry laugh nor friendship's sigh nor music's tones break through the graves profound why has the wish for immortality e'er crossed the heart if we no more must be slowly to silence died the strain but not the thoughts it woke a chain is life made up of things too small to notice as they pass yet all are linked perhaps in happier hours those words like perfume from the flowers had passed unheeded now they broke the spell which bound him and he spoke tis so we do not fear to die but in forgetfulness to lie who who but shrinks from that the sire hopes to live in his son the liar the minstrel thinks shall breathe his name to distant ages for this fame our heroes died upon yon plains our fathers reared those marble fanes i have but just begun to live if it is life to know and feel the powers within me yet how soon death on my steps will steal if there be life beyond the tomb the mystery of my being solved the manhood of the soul is there and good from evil is evolved 
and from confusion order fair but let us seek corinna now they found her bending o'er her lyre more gloom than want was on her brow her fingers trembling on the wire and there while round them closed the flowers he told what never grecian bowers had heard before in silence both the lovely listeners heard but one listened to the truth the other's ear heard but that voice she loved alone nor record more than music's tone when she and dionysius part left those high themes on myra's heart end of part six part seven of dionysius the areopagite with other poems by anne hawkshaw this librivox recording is in the public domain dionysius the areopagite part one seven time passed a still and starry night looked with its countless eyes of light upon the world beneath that sky dionysius wandered silently upon his couch he could not rest for many cares his heart oppressed he felt the christian faith was true to own that faith was to undo the strongest ties that bind to life and his heart quivered with the strife for Myra's father was of those who were the Christians' bitterest foes, a stoic, cold and proud and stern, whom neither prayers nor fears could turn. Amid the dwellings of the dead, the Athenians' silent footsteps tread. A spirit of repose profound seemed to have shed its influence round, where, pale beneath the moonlight, shone the funeral urns of Parian stone round which affection's hand had spread sweet flowers to wither o'er the dead around above the midnight breeze sighed through the darkening cypress trees ah on the heart in sorrow's hour all nature hath a saddening power her sweetest harp hath jarring strings from which the heart no music brings but only discord on his ear there came a voice soft low but clear he started at the well-known tone and there beside a funeral stone like willow bending to the gale corinna knelt with forehead pale back from her face her veil was flung and round her slender form it hung if from each narrow resting-place had looked a dim and shadowy face not dionysius more amazed upon the solemn scene had gazed before her with his hands outspread above corinna's bended head the apostle stood he saw him last as from the hill of mars he passed but there was something sweeter now upon his careworn furrowed brow for in that maiden kneeling there he saw an answer to his prayer in the almighty father's name in his who as a saviour came in his the spirits one in three the all-pervading deity i do baptize thee then was shed the water on her youthful head he prayed and with low solemn tone spake thus as at the eternal's throne it seems as if from off my heart like shadows that in life depart fade now the things of earth forgot like trifles that concern it not and all the joys and charms of life and death with its appointed strife vanish into a brighter sky that reaches to eternity yet daughter no to die is gain but not to live on earth is vain wait calmly till the summons given shall bid thee rise to god to heaven use not despise the gifts of life faint not amid its toils and strife peace rest upon thee now i go to labour midst this world of woe thou like a lamb upon the wild must still be left poor orphan child but then if storms shall here assail thee the help of god will never fail thee time is a shadow fast tis fleeting eternal dawn thee me is greeting 
she rose in silence meekly clasped his aged hand in hers and passed end of part seven part eight of dionysius the areopagite with other poems by anne hawkshaw this librivox recording is in the public domain dionysius the areopagite part one eight tis evening that still quiet hour which falls with soft but mystic power on human hearts when passions cease their tumult and subside to peace when from the deep and strong control of sense escapes the wearied soul and looks within herself and none for converse asks but fain alone to talk unto herself would be and muse in thought unchecked and free then with a slow and solemn pace we walk to look on nature's face while on the lagging breezes come the evening insects drowsy hum and if by chance the sound of horn or sprightlier strain be on it borne the listener starts disturbed and fain would shrink into himself again then not so much we strive to pry into a dim futurity or turn with sad and wistful gaze back on the scenes of other days nor in the things around doth find aught that she loves the pensive mind but chiefly to herself she turns and with herself communes and learns musing alone at that still hour corinna sat within her bower when dionysius entered start not maiden at what i impart with courage far beyond thy years conferring not with woman's fears at midnight by the lonely dead i heard thee with no voice of dread confess the christian faith i too believe the christian creed is true nor sceptic doubts nor coward fears have made me shrink but myra's tears were mine alone the destiny of suffering it would lighter be or had she but that purer faith that triumphs over griefs and death i could have kissed her brow in peace peace when compared to what i feel twould be but parting till should cease these throbbing pulses and the tomb should reunite our severed doom as two fair barks together starting but on life's stormy ocean parting yet anchoring side by side at last sailing apart on life's dark sea but meeting in eternity hard hath the struggle been for days have seemed as years but now delays are criminal and ere yon sun shall have his morrow's course begun i am a christian now farewell i sought thee that thou mightest tell to myra that i come not say not where i go the coming day i will myself reveal the cause but now i cannot fare thee well i go to where the christians dwell end of part eight Part nine of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, Part one, nine. How sweetly wakes the earth from rest, as if it held no aching breast. Bright clouds are on the mountain's crest, and trembling shadows on the plain and whispering winds upon the main a voice of hope a sound of mirth go forth upon the peopled earth arousing man to toil again yet kindly with a joyous strain for every feeling hath its hour wherein with deep unwonted power it presses on the earth each one too hath its place amid the aisles in the dim light of gothic piles or in the homes of races gone where the sad night wind sighs and swells that sister of the past pale memory dwells hope hath the field of waving grain the cottage home the cultured plain and on the lofty mountain's breast 
with shadowy sides and sunny crest wake feelings deep though scarce defined feelings that elevate the mind although there may an awe o'erspread the stranger's heart when o'er his head hang the dark beetling rocks tis not such awe as haunts the lonely spot where thick and tall the forest trees bow not their heads to passing breeze where all below mid grass and weed the toad and stealthy serpents breed and where the gladdening light of day ne'er reaches to the lonely way nor sunbeams pierce nor branches play e'en common minds that seldom look in nature's vast and varied book can feel the different influence made by alpine steeps or forest shade and thus the druid's altar stood deep in some unfrequented wood or on the wild and dreary plain fear bound them in her slavish chain and fear alone the scene inspired but loftier thoughts the persian fired on high his shrine of flame he piled dark superstition's purest child fair greece not bloody rites were thine no human victim to thy shrine was bound in sad despair thy fanes arose in beauty on thy plains or mid the light and graceful grove where shades and sunbeams were in wove in symboled forms the egyptian shrined the workings of a deeper mind greece had the beautiful the dim and mystic thou o oh, mizraim there is such lone but lovely spot the busy man hath now forgot but morning when she wakes in smiles o'er grecian seas and aegean isles forgets it not but gives a beam to light its unremembered stream and sends her winds with gentle tones throughout its caverns fretted stones save here and there a sculptured stone with moss and ivy overgrown nature again hath claimed her own from man for once these silent bowers he made the scene of mystic powers and near them shrine and altar stood embowered within an ancient wood where anxious myra sought to know what coming years had to bestow a veil concealed her lovely face on which sad tears had left their trace while she upon the altar placed a crystal vase with gems enchased i come she said to seek your aid ye dryads of this sacred shade and thou dread power whate'er thou art that canst to winds and streams impart the voices of futurity tell what my coming fate may be olympian gods and ye who dwell with him who rules the world of hell and ye who tread with silver feet on ocean's breast whose deep retreat beneath the ever-sounding wave no mortal eye hath seen oh save nor blast with all-consuming fire him who denies you in your ire accept this vase as from his hand enriched with gems from many a land and i on each returning year will duly at this shrine appear with costlier gifts if o'er his head ye still the sacred aegis spread but other griefs oppress my heart than that in which he bears a part the snake beneath the rose may bask and if beneath fair friendship's mask seeming the loving and the true there lurks deceit in her who grew in the same home avenging powers to punish and to judge be yours neath a small cavern overhung with climbing flowers a fountain sprung and by it seated on a stone a fair young priestess sat alone pale was her brow the lines of thought or passion there had traces wrought her eye was bright with wandering fire wild as the music from her lyre amongst whose strings her fingers strayed and sad uncertain measures played with mind half wrecked deceived betrayed by one she loved that hapless maid came wandering to the sacred shade from wily priests a home receiving living deceived and deceiving 
the tool of more designing minds she in the streams and sighing winds fancied she heard sweet voices speak and words of mystic import break beside her myra knelt and told her griefs and questions while the tears stole from her downcast eyes the tale wakened the memory of past years in the young sibyl's heart who raised her eyes and long on myra gazed but soon like wandering lights that gleam a moment o'er a turbid stream that transient ray of mine departed and from her seat she wildly started and with her lyre uplifted strung with rapid hand its chords and sung back from my sight the present hold scenes of futurity unfold voices that never yet have spoken words that upon no ear have broken come come then o'er the fountain bent she sadly chanted as she leant i see upon thy crystal face the sunbeam hath not left a trace that glittered there at dawn of day thus hopes of mortals pass away spirit of the wind though near thee mortal maiden need not fear thee ever changing as thou art for she trusts a fickler heart thou hast stolen the sweets away in the rose's bud that lay thou hast swept across the lyre hushed its music snapped its wire canst thou carry back again those sweets or that forgotten strain then the heart once more may cherish hopes that love hath made to perish young and beautiful is she fountain nymph who asks of thee what her future fate may be i hear thee in these tones replying sad as sappho's song when dying and her scenes of coming life with their hopes and fears and strife one by one arise before me dim and shadowy they restore me bygone years through yon blue sky i've seen our twin stars wander by i watched them rise without a cloud i saw them set behind a shroud of cold dark vapours is her fate then like to one so desolate the past and future are our all of life as leaves unnoticed fall so drop the present hours the past had hopes and joys that did not last the future too shall have its dream but fainter darker it shall seem once with a mortal race i moved and as a mortal thought and loved but now mid coming years i tread as mid the living stand the dead but listen think ye twas the wind a deeper voice it left behind look see ye but the fountain play i see the deeds of many a day pictured upon its dancing spray i heard that voice say trust not thou to friendship's faith to lover's vow both soon will fail thee as that spray upon the water dies away i see a low unhonoured tomb appear through clouds of coming doom that gather round their paths who scorn the altars of our gods forlorn from jove's immortal wrath they tread the dreary regions of the dead the dark sea hath its wrecks how deep the gold and gems of navies sleep man with long years of care and toil uproots them from their native soil but in an hour its wrathful waves give them to strew its silent caves earth hath her wrecks in lonely halls the lizard creeps on mouldering walls the ivy twines the wild wind sings its requiem o'er the place of kings but time hath sadder wrecks the truth the hope the trust the love of youth weep for them as they fade yet tears bring not again departed years but when upon thy youthful brow the cloud is gathering when the glow is fading from thy rosy cheek these sacred shades and fountains seek 
and read the sealed book of fate for others though it be too late to change thine own away away tis now but the soft wind at play amongst the leaves the pictures fade upon the fount go grecian maid the skies with sunset splendour burned as myra to her home returned sunset that radiant hour which lies upon the verge of darkening skies like hope by disappointment life upon death's threshold tis an hour of potent but of varied power not joyous as the wakening light not solemn as the starry night not calm as twilight but of these made up as are our destinies then hope and memory draw by turn their records from the heart's deep urn and thus did myra's heart that night with sadness sink with hope grow bright drawing from the sighing air motives for a deep despair building up fairy bowers of ease on sunbeams trembling o'er the seas ah long ah long such hearts will cling with hope to the most hopeless thing end of part nine Part ten of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, Part one, ten. The wave still laves the Aegean shore, but the lyre echoes back no more the music that its waters make, and still. O'er Grecian mountains break as bright a sun as ever shone when freedom called the land her own, and live there none to hail those beams as omen of their better dreams, none who, while seeing sky and sun, remember what their sires have done. Snapped is the cord, and souls of fire live not when dust bestrews the lyre. Thy shores are silent, tuneful Greece who who shall bid the silence cease twas noontide on the gorgeous room a cloud was settled of perfume for not a breath of wind was there the rich and balmy scents to bear when a luxurious indolence steeps every thought and every sense and the mind loves alone to brood in the voluptuous solitude of half-closed rooms with not a sound save water falling to the ground from marble fountain whose dull tone lulls as the ceaseless shower is thrown then half awake and half asleep the drowsy senses pastime keep visions like eastern fables rise and float before the charmed eyes of streams whose crystal waters run o'er golden sands to meet the sun or sailing on a shoreless sea lulled by the drowsy melody far far away we seem to be upon a couch from persian loom sat the fair myra in that room so full of beauty and perfume but she his mistress bent in tears above the hopes of early years and dionysius knelt beside her destined not to be his bride call me not false at length he said my first last love is on thee stayed call me not false my heart remains still bound to thine by stronger chains than bind to life death's dreaded darts may pierce the frame but this the heart then wherefore said the weeping girl her dark eyes lifted to his face this stranger's mystic creed embrace thou mightest have known my sire would scorn a doctrine all so basely born or why not build a secret shrine and worship there this god of thine oh tempt me not eternity and the soul's endless destiny hang on a breath and not the tears of anguish shed in after years not tears of blood might have the power to wash the guilt from such an hour 
I dare not hide my faith. This name must be my glory, not my shame. Then we must part. Oh, that my tears could bring me back my childhood's years. For all that I shall have of thee, in past, not future years will be. Or for the power to be again a careless child, to break the chain that binds me to thee. Wherefore give, ye gods, the wretched boon to live, and yet to suffer? Ye who know no sorrow, still might pity woe. Tearless and motionless she stood, with lip and brow so sadly pale, as Ariadne o'er the flood had watched her Theseus's darkening sail, when he had risen to depart, and once more clasped her to his heart, saying, in accents low and broken, in words expressed, though scarcely spoken, I love thee with a love beyond all things beside, save that I give to him, in whom I move and live, the power who, though unseen, yet nigh, hath watched our steps from infancy, and still his sheltering wing shall spread above the severed path we tread, and when the stream of life shall be fast ebbing to eternity, my dying prayers shall be for thee. Night came, and the fair moon arose in its still beauty from repose, full, clear, and cloudless, and the wave back her reflected image gave. Night came, with soft and gentle hand closing the flowers of that fair land, and scattering from her urn the dew their drooping blossoms to renew, or whispering in the sleeper's ear tones that he never more shall hear. But other light is on the stream than the moon's soft and silvery beam. A thousand flickering torches gleam, half seen, half hidden, as the gale waved to and fro the feathery veil that the tall palm-tree's foliage made, screening the temples in their shade as the procession moved along with festive dance and choral song. For twas a festival that night, and Athens sent her fair and bright and young and gifted to entwine with songs and flowers Diana's shrine. Children in snowy tunic dressed, with hands crossed on each happy breast, youths crowned with laurel, these are past, but come the loveliest and the last, the maids of Athens, Soft they tread, a basket on each graceful head of choicest flowers, on which was flung a veil which o'er the maiden hung. And Myra, must thy heavy heart take mid this pageantry apart? Yes, she is in the festive band, the loveliest daughter of the land. Onward they passed. There is a power in dwelling in the moonlit hour, not like the sun's. The rays it throws lull the deep passions to repose. Dreams that mid-noonday splendours sleep. Thoughts linked with feelings loved and deep, which hearts mid noise and toil will keep, gush forth as its long shadows fall o'er the still lake or lonely hall. Tis memory's hour, for back it brings thoughts of our lost and loveliest things hopes, loves, and friendships buried long, the lute-like sound of childhood's song, the mirth, the music, and the flowers of mountain homes or woodland bowers, for tis not rudely then the chord of memories touched. There wakes a note, softened and mournful as the tones that round the Egyptian statue float, when the last beam of parting day is passing in the west away. But listen, tis the voice of song, And music's tones that float along, Music o'er moonlit waters stealing, Dead is the heart to love, to feeling, That hears unmoved, nor breathes a sigh, For what was loved in days gone by. Now from the grove emerge the band, And round the sylvan altar stand, And then again the voice of song, Breezes and waters bear along, Goddess of the sylvan bow, Youths and maidens hail thee now, While softly fall thine own pure beams, Like silver arrows on the streams, 
Latona's daughter, hail! Hear us from the forest glades, Hear us from the grotto's shades, Where thy tall majestic mien In the fountain's wave is seen. Latona's daughter, hail! Spare, oh, spare the youthful band That around thine altar stand. Let no matron desolate Share in the sad mother's fate, But send thy vengeful shafts afar In the sports of sylvan war. Latona's daughter, hail! Who stands in silence by that stream On which the torch and moonlight gleam? Tis he who now an exile seems Even by his native streams. Parted from her he loved, He sought some lonely spot Where burdened thought might be unchecked. When music's strain Roused him to consciousness again. There was a music sad and wild In the lyre's tones When wafted o'er the still clear waters. And he stood, listening them Die upon the shore. Bright shone the temple's gilded pile, Young faces beamed with many a smile, But Dionysius's softened eye Gazed but on one impassionedly. Back from her face her veil was thrown, And pale as monumental stone were cheek and brow. The drooping lid with its long fringe The dark eye hid. One fair but fading sister's flower Her hand had gathered from her bower, and placed amid her shining hair, and as it drooped and withered there, it seemed an emblem of her fate, blighted by one who did not hate. Oh, never, never did she seem so like the being of his dream, as when, with bending head, she stood that night beside the crystal flood. She saw him not, but turned again to join the home-returning train. He gazed on her retiring tread, like one who looks upon the dead, and when each sound and form were past, still gazed where he had seen her last. Nor moved, nor spoke, for common grief may find in tears, in words, relief. But there are woes we cannot speak, and greater than bedew the cheek. End of part 10「Part 11 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Dionysius the Areopagite Part 1 11 Morn came, but with a lurid light That followed on the steps of night Not darkness and not light But gloom that seemed to speak of hastening doom Hushed nature, listening, seemed to wait The signs or woes of coming fate. The sea, with deep and sullen roar, Without a wind, swept on the shore, And sounds of revelry were o'er. At last arose a general cry, First faint and low, then swelling high, And on it passed, still gathering strength Throughout that crowded city's length. Each one was hurrying to and fro, As if to shun some dreaded foe. Some turned them to their homes to die, Some prayed for pity from the sky, Some cursed the gods who would not save Their votaries from a loathsome grave. The plague had come, its wings were spread As o'er a city of the dead. Come, like a spirit from the deep, The carnival of death to keep. Its drink, a nation's tears, And sighs of dying men, The melodies that charm its ears. On, on it came, Firstborn of death, With fearful name. It passed with noiseless footstep by, Numbering the living with the dead, Unseen its form of mystery, As on it sped. It spared not beauty in its pride, It snatched the bridegroom from the bride, it breathed upon the sleeping child, Whilst in its mother's arms it smiled, And as the mother o'er it wept, Throughout her veins the poison crept, And while she caught its dying sigh, Death darkened o'er her tearful eye. There was no glitter, naught to hide, T'was death unmasked, 
and in its pride treading alike o'er prince and slave not giving e'en a costlier grave the last poor boon the great can claim above the man of meaner name no in that hour of fear and doom all shared alike a common tomb days passed and silence reigned around silence unbroken by a sound of, of choral hymn or harp or lute or gladsome foot all these were mute yes it was silence though twas broken for words were whispered and not spoken weeks passed and grass and wild flowers grew in silent homes and wild birds flew down temple aisles and empty streets unscathed as in their own retreats the boats lay rotting on the shore with starting plank and splitting oar the galleys drifted to and fro where'er the breeze might chance to blow with colours drooping o'er their side and cordage dragging in the tide while masts and spars and useless sails rich spices gums and precious bales from persian looms unheeded lay to the fierce sun and waves a prey treasures untold were on that strand untouched by human spoiler's hand who thought of treasures cared for gems death bargain not for diadems died in all breasts love hope and pride and last of all e'en avarice died some drifted on with canvas spread dark charnel houses of the dead for breathed there none of mortal mould within the lone and loathsome hold none left to tell the dismal tale none left his fellow to bewail but worst of all the fate of him who watching by his shipmates clay saw the last rays of light grow dim and then to darkening shades give way leaving him there mid death and gloom like the last lamp within a tomb mid noxious vapours faintly gleaming and none of its existence dreaming foe thought no more of foe nor friend thought of his friend twas passion's end a hideous quiet brooded o'er the city and the silent shore priests by the shrines they watched were lying the sacred lamps around them dying the bard beside his lyre was laid and the wild wind his requiem played among its silver chords in dust the sculptor left the unfinished bust men crept along the empty street with fearful look and lagging feet and were there none to nobly dare death mid this pestilential air to aid their fellows none to cheer the lonely orphan's bitter fear none with kind hand to dry its tear yes there were some a little band the christians of that classic land and first mid danger in that form more fearful than a field or storm wert thou athenian friend or foe alike to thee if common woe made them alike thy footsteps fall at midnight through the silent hall and by the dim forsaken shrine when the first rays of morning shine by the deserted sick wert thou though with pale lip and mournful brow oft when with toil and watching worn the weary body was o'erborne he sought in one forsaken home an hour of quiet not of rest the echoes of its silent halls woke other feelings in his breast the fountain threw its ceaseless shower o'er choking weed and withering flower the wind its dirge-like music played through empty hall and colonnade still ranged around the lonely room the vases stood but no perfume breathed from the flowers which pale and dead their withered blossoms round had shed one sound one footstep only broke the silence and the echoes woke the watchdog still his station kept and by the threshold altar slept guarding the lonely spot with care as if still myra's home were there tis vain thy faithful care tis vain her hand from off thy neck the chain poor dog 
shall never loose again far from her own bright land is she in the soft clime of italy when first arose the general cry that told the common foe was nigh all fled who had the power to fly save those whom love restrained and he votary of stern necessity the stoic he too fled and bore his daughter to the italian shore with her corinna went the tie by friendship twined from infancy she would not break although her heart sunk from her native land to part and now beneath the palace dome they dwelt within imperial rome twas evening when the vessel bore those exiles from the grecian shore and the pine woods on mountains high stood out against a glowing sky with earnest eye corinna stood gazing across the aegean flood to the receding shore with hands clasped on her breast pale myra stands while down her cheeks the ceaseless tears flow o'er the faded hopes of years all centred in that land whose shrines are sinking fast to shadowy lines e'en as she looks in tears alone her grief can make its sorrows known but calm corinna's found a tone in song that softly floated by borne by the wind upon those shores to die corinna's parting song there is a voice comes o'er the deep blue sea in solemn tone it speaketh thus to me daughter this land thine eyes no more shall see and then the caverns of the silent shore take up the words and echo back no more that voice speaks not unto the outward ear but still its tones my lonely heart can hear chilling it with a sickly sense of fear a dark foreboding of a coming doom i know not what perchance an exile's tomb farewell my glorious land thy hills and streams in yon far land will flit across my dreams as through thy laurel bowers glance summer's golden beams making a transient sunshine mid the shade that on my young but troubled heart is laid there is a brighter land than thine fair clime beyond the bounds of earth the shores of time beyond the reach of sorrow and of crime eternity's vast ocean round it rolls it is the spirit's home the home of ransomed souls end of part 11Part 12 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, Part 2, 1. The dust of ages is upon thee, Rome. Dark were thy deeds, and dark hath been thy doom. The blood of martyred saints bedewed thy sod, its voice ascended from thy hills to God the winds took up their dying groans the wave back to the earth its answering echo gave and o'er thy vine-clad shores thy sunny sea it brooded like the voice of prophecy and vengeance heard its tones and woke at last at the still midnight pealed the gothic blast and through thy streets the hosts of alaric passed all vice is thine the savage and refined that waste the body enervate the mind what were thy pastimes that the arena tell where for thy sport the gladiator fell far from the stormy lands that gave him birth he sank unpitied in thy crimson earth but died not unavenged that stormy north sent its dark hordes of fierce barbarians forth shorn of thy might abused like him who trod in gaza's prison when forsook of god beneath their footsteps thou didst sink to rise a blasting meteor in malignant skies to shine o'er slumbering europe's mental night with blinding flashes of uncertain light mothers of crimes and errors thou hast been 
in every age except thine earliest scene then thou hadst savage virtues such as grace the desert arab or the red man's race canadian woods zahara's wastes can tell where freedom conquered and where valour fell then boast not thou thine empire passed away i cannot mourn but temples in decay the crumbling arches and the ruined fanes that strew with wrecks thy solitary plains i do regret for they should keep alive the flame of art and empire's fall survive listen what sounds are on the breeze the whisper of the olive trees and tiber's deep and solemn tide the fall of fountains nought beside yes songs and music and the beat on marble floors of dancers feet and childhood's laugh so glad and clear and charger's tramp and clanging spear and chariot's rattle and the throng of myriads as they sweep along yes these are there but on the breeze my spirit hears more sounds than these the sigh of misery borne along by the same wind that bears the song oppression's scarcely uttered plaint the dying groan of martyred saint the captive's voice that from the gloom breaks of the dungeon's living tomb with dull sepulchral tone the glee and laugh of wild insanity revenge's slowly uttered vow these through the city's murmurs flow what seest thou rome imperial rome untouched by age unmarred by doom though centuries since its birth have gone and the fourth caesar fills the throne i see its capital that shrines the ancient sibyl's mystic lines the invader's hand the tempest shock have left it on its native rock to look in proud defiance o'er campania's plain and ostia's shore i see amidst its gardens rise with all that luxury can devise the caesar's golden palace gems that might have glowed in diadems with rich mosaics stud its walls and glitter in its marble halls spoils from the east spoils from the west are poured into that city's breast the pearls in persia's gulf that gleam the diamond that hath caught its beam of splendour from an orient sun she hath desired and she hath won amber the roman bought of thee dark danube and thou tideless sea and babylonian looms supplied carpets of hundred colours dyed while grecian vases in her rooms were filled with far ceylon's perfumes bring the falernian wine bring flowers and watch not as the tempest lowers patrician tread thy halls to-night forgetting ere the morrow's light secret and swift from yonder hall the tyrant's axe may on thee fall they live not for the coming day who live beneath the nero's sway the mariner on ocean's wave forgets that from a stormy grave a plank divides the mountain child sports where the avalanche is piled and poised upon a breath then sound the lyre and bid the bowl go round hushed be the voice of weeping shed no tear above the murdered dead tell not the winds thy grief forbear to tell the waters thy despair breathe it not in the city's crowd whisper it not in solitude trust not thy fellows live apart though midst them with suspecting heart end of part 12part 13 of dionysius the areopagite with other poems by anne hawkshaw this librivox recording is in the public domain dionysius the areopagite part 2 2 the city sleeps at dead of night there shoots to heaven a spire of light tis but a meteor's flash it dies and darker seem the starless skies again it glows it is the light kindled upon the alban height the watchfire of the guards tis gone and all again is dark and lone it burst again one sheet of flame as if from etna's breast it came reddening along the midnight sky and with it rose the troubled cry of frighted thousands rushing by rushing they knew not whither 
still on rolled its fiery waves until the city looked one funeral pile seen o'er the plains for many a mile it sunk at last and pitchy smoke from out the smouldering ashes broke where is the splendid city now that stood upon the seven hills brow but yesterday the roofless halls and gaping cracks and blackening walls columns still standing but o'erthrown the sculptured pediment of stone which rested on them these proclaim that well hath done its task that flame time in his slow and solemn march twines the bright ivy round the arch he crumbles with his touch but fire like human conqueror in his ire spares nought gives nought but leaves a waste blackened and lonely and defaced days passed but days may do the work of years and in a moment's space may crowd the fate of centuries or nations we'll embrace days passed and rome in ruin lies the winds her starving people's cries bear to the guilty monarch's ears and for his throne the tyrant fears he gives the christians to their ire and blood their blood to quench the fire oh shroud the picture pass it o'er the pains those suffering christians bore a mystery now we shrink to read more than the martyr shrank to bleed End of part 13Part 14 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, Part 2, 3. Those few brief days thy faith revealed, Corinna, and thy fate was sealed. Her heathen friend and foreign birth had screened her from the oppressor's hand if no betrayer had been found within their household band. Michele, Myra's favourite slave, the needful information gave. Born mid Thessalian rocks, her mind, though with no common strength combined, was superstition's own. No ray of mental culture cheered her way, but in her dark, untutored breast, one feeling stronger than the rest. Fidelity, no change could change, no distance and no time estrange, burnt quenchless to the last. Her love for her she served arose above e'en reverence for a pagan creed, that love had prompted her to hate Corinna, whom she falsely thought had brought a cloud o'er Myra's fate. Beside Corinna she had been, amid that sad and gloomy scene, when she received the Christian's rite, beneath the silent vault of night. Some fearful and mysterious power, she thought, was given by that hour, and when she saw on Myra's cheek the colour fade, and week by week her once bright eyes grow sad and dim with many tears, and all for him who, like Corinna, now despised the gods and rites for ages prized, she thought Corinna's spells had changed the heart that thus appeared estranged, and hatred, deep as blind, possessed the dark recesses of her breast. Hints of her doubts and fears the slave oft to her sorrowing mistress gave, and though at first they seemed to glide from off her mind, they did divide hearts once in friendship joined. No word of anger told it, but the tone and looks and actions, nameless all, that tell us we are loved, were gone, and intercourse grew cold and strange, though words could not express the change. T'was felt, not seen, a poisonous wind, known by the waste it left behind. Aroused at midnight from repose, Corinna yielded to her foes, born to a neighbouring court she stood mid those prepared to shed her blood alone unaided hail the god who rules olympus with his nod said the proconsul in yon flame the incense cast invoke his name and bow before his dreaded shrine and life and liberty are thine speakest thou not wilt thou throw away in the bright morning of thy day 
the life that others hoard with care how wilt thou death's fierce torture bear whence art thou from the grecian shore i am she could not utter more through the fast falling tears her eyes seemed to look on her native skies with starlight on the athenian plain where she must never tread again perhaps some touch of pity stole e'en through that roman judge's soul in tones less harsh he spoke and thou ere care hath wrinkled o'er thy brow what canst thou know of creeds thy sires adored these gods your poets lyres were tuned to praise them all that's great and noble in your past estate and all you still have in those piles that rise upon your plains and isles your statues wanting breath alone humanity transferred to stone as if by medusa's touch all sprung while to your ancient gods ye clung is there no charm in life no pain in death bethink thee yet again low but distinct her answer rose amid the silence of her foes is there no charm in life she said and slowly raised her drooping head while from the brow they late had shaded her long bright ringlets fell unbraided is there no charm in life does earth then utter forth her sounds of mirth and spread her scenes of beauty o'er the asia sea and peopled shore in vain and can the human heart from all it loves and loved depart without a sigh hath death no pain ask those who choose the cankering chain for years and bless the dungeon's gloom that saves them from the darker tomb i fear expiring nature's strife i shrink from suffering cling to life yet i e'en i am here to die rather than him my lord deny men for their native land expire friend dies for friend and child for sire and may not i this life resign for him who gave his life for mine enough replied the judge away lead her ye guards the guards obey twas not to instant death but doom as fearful mid the damp and gloom of a small prison day by day to feel life's pulses ebb away to watch the morning sunbeams creep across the floor to bend and weep alone then hear the moaning breeze at midnight through the arches sigh to dream of the far-sounding seas and isles that on their bosom lie in sunlight bathed and then to wake and hear the chain and fetter shake with darkness like the graves around but where's the history who may tell the story of that captive cell ask the dark walls who on them traced the lines that damp and time effaced or ask the moonbeam how its gleam woke the pale inmate from her dream of other days or ask the ray that found its lone and devious way through the small lattice ask how long the feeble frame endured the gloom the damp the chain the living tomb and ask how long the immortal mind the spark within that frame enshrined burnt brightly ere it winged its flight from dungeon gloom to rayless light scorning the fetter and the chain that would have bound it but in vain yet judge not happiness by things that make it not tis not enshrined in palaces its home is mind go not to woods nor wilds they keep no secret charms nor can the deep soft tones of nature lull to sleep passion's wild tumults can the voice of fame the wearied heart rejoice turn to that heart it holds within its little space a depth of woe or happiness that all may know the lowliest couch of pain may be a place of rest and peace to thee if in calm confidence resigned on heaven and god repose thy mind weeks sped their flight they left no trace on many a young and happy face nor tinged they with a richer dye the foliage of that southern sky nor gave its winds a deeper sigh 
but measure not by days and hours man's life ye may the life of flowers or insects one dark day may call forth energies the silent fall of years had left unknown to sleep within the soul's recesses deep weeks sped their flight and left a trace a withering touch on one young face that paler grew from day to day a snow wreath passing fast away corinna did thy spirit rise in triumph to thy native skies or did it calmly pass away like stars that fade at dawn of day who who may tell there was not one to watch beside thy couch of stone but there were those who heard thy hymn when evening threw its shadows dim across thy cell it ceased at last and silence told that all was past end of part 14「15 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, Part 2, 4. There was a footstep in that cell. T'was not the jailer's, for it fell soft as the snowflake. And a form of female beauty glided through the open door. Her feet with dew were wet for she had left her bower in secret at that early hour. Tis Myra, but beyond the hate of foes or love of friends art thou, Corinna. She hath come too late. What, will not even woman dare, prompted by sorrow or despair? Mikali had the truth concealed, that she Corinna's faith revealed until the previous day. The thought that thus, for her the crime was wrought, was agony to Myra's heart, that whispered too the foolish part that she had acted and each word of hasty anger long interred seemed sounded in her ears again mixed with the clanking of the chain that bound her friend and bitter tears flowed as she thought of other years she bribed the guards and stood alone beside corinna's couch of stone calm as in sleep the martyr lay on her pale brow the morning's ray shone as in mockery myra crept beside her thinking that she slept and bent to kiss her cheek twas death though death as beautiful as sleep that met her gaze of anguish deep she did not move she did not weep but bent above the martyred dead till sight and sound and reason fled how long she lay unconscious there none knew she said twas months twas years an age of agony and fears that storms lay desolate and bare for reason though it gleamed again no more burnt calmly in her brain they found her seated by the dead she turned not at their heavy tread she neither seemed to hear nor know a sight or sound but that one woe but when she saw them rudely take that form and bear it from the cell she seemed as from a dream to wake and burning tear-drops fell a burst of wild and passionate grief yielding the heart no kind relief they led her home and calmer hours stole o'er her but her mind its powers no more regained twas like the flowers the tempest shakes that may live on though all their sweets and bloom be gone still beautiful she looked her hair shading a brow so deathly fair yet circled with its jewelled band for still her maids arrayed with care her form as if to hide the truth that canker gnawed the bud of youth there was a tinge upon her cheek that more of death than life might speak as fading colours on the sky when night or storm are gathering nigh a parting beam of beauty passed most beautiful because the last she named no wish no joy no pain but if she heard a grecian strain she hid her face yet never wept save that first burst of tears her eye was like a desert fountain dry o'er which the burning wind hath swept 
she twined a wreath of fading flowers around Corinna's silent lyre, flowers that one day of beauty see and then expire. Each morn her hands the wreath renewed from buds with midnight dews embued, but if her fingers touched its string, she seemed like one whose hand profanes a relic or a sacred thing. She never spoke of him by name, whose memory, like slow burning flame, was in her heart. But when alone they heard her oft in gentle tone, with voice so sad and yet so sweet, the story of their love repeat. No angry thoughts her bosom crossed, not false she called him now, but lost, oft raising to the evening skies her beautiful but mournful eyes. It seemed as if o'er memory came some vague and dream-like thought of hours passed with him in their Grecian bowers, and she would slowly, murmuring, say, as on her gilded couch she lay, I loved him, oh, how well! She died when spring gave earth again its flowers. She died her father's last sole pride. Not long before her spirit passed, like lamps that brightest burn at last, reason returned. I am, she said, like one awaking from a sleep, disturbed by wild and fearful dreams, and who but wakes to weep? I feel that this is death, and death, what is it but the feeble breath passing away? Is there no more of life than I have journeyed o'er? Is there not yet another shore? Or am I foundering on a sea, immeasureless, no more to be? Tell me, nor leave me thus to die, trembling in sad uncertainty. Is it a dream, or am I past the stream of death, and look at last on those whom I have loved? I see, my Dionysius, yes, tis he. A moment, and his arms were thrown around that fair but wasted form that soon the grave would call its own. One long embrace, and then the tears of joys, of sorrows, and of fears, like drops from many fountains sprung, mixed in one stream as on they ran. Still to her lover's arm she clung, but o'er her face a deeper shade than ever earthly passion made soon stole. She fixed a troubled eye on the tints fading from the sky, saying, Ere night perchance I die, I deemed all earthly thoughts were lost in the wild sea on which I tossed, but sight of thee has joined again the links of many a broken chain, but no, it must not be, no bride but death's can Myra be. My guide to brighter shores, if such there be, not what thou wert in thee I'll see. I feel the time is brief, nor tears must choke thy voice, nor doubting fears must fill thy heart. I scorn these themes when filled with pride and passion's dreams. Yes, dreams they were, from which I woke to die. Like one a sudden stroke has stunned, yet rouses by the fear of danger or of suffering near, Dionysius nerved himself to speak, though grief had blanched his lip and cheek, and his deep voice was low and weak. Calmly she lay upon his arm, as if there were some sacred charm in the high themes of which he told, that soothed her heart to hope and peace, yet did not speak. But if he paused, she motioned him still not to cease. Raising her eyes to his, one sigh so soft, "'Twas scarcely heard, the tie of nature broke. "'The spirit fled, the loved, the beautiful, was dead. "'A tinge still on her cheek reposed, "'but the dark eyes no more unclosed. "'Too beautiful to yield to death seemed the fair form, "'and long he kept his station by her couch and wept. "'Years with their changes, swept away the scenes of many an after day but on his memory fresh they left that scene the high white forehead bare in cold and unchanged beauty there 
it seemed as if relenting death had only gently stopped the breath not marred with ruthless hand one trace of loveliness in form or face a statue from her own bright clime she looked and not a thing for time so soon to give to dust and thus her image on his memory rose in after years calm cold but fair in the still beauty of repose not her the beautiful and gay but myra as in death she lay End of part 15Part 16 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, Part 2, 5. A day, tis but a day, brief hours marked by the closed and opening flowers, by golden light upon the skies at morn and by the roseate dyes on evening's stilly cloud that lies yet who when those few hours are run is the same being who began his course with the uprising sun i speak not of the mortal frame it is not yet may look the same but who when evening shades are creeping across the vale and flowers are sleeping feels as he did when morning broke in splendour and to life he woke the heart as if the body's rest it too had shared within the breast beats lightly thought upon the wing is soaring hope imagining and fortitude with steadfast eye calmly awaiting destiny but evening comes and weary-hearted back to the goal from which we started we look again upon it lie like mists the dreams of vanity and mid the gathering glooms arise as phantoms to the sleeper's eyes dark guilty thoughts lost hopes lost time youth's follies or fierce manhood's crime how was he changed who sat that night by myra's couch of dreamless sleep thoughts cherished at the wakening light like it had faded from the sky like her had been but loved to die at morn he sought the italian shore with hopes that now exist no more there stood beside that couch of death her sire he had not watched her die but now with fixed and tearless eye he gazed upon the dead his breath deeply he drew but not a word told how his inmost heart was stirred the past the future o'er him came slowly at length he named her name and said she was my only one and now i tread the world alone well be it so the hand of fate hath made a father desolate but tis beyond his power to shake his steady soul the reed will break before the storm and such a reed art thou and such thy christian creed upon him dionysius turned once at such scorn his cheek had burned but he had learned a lesson taught not in the schools of men and wrought a conquest o'er himself a reed thou think'st me and my christian creed because i weep in anguish o'er the form i soon shall see no more oh less than human should i be to shed no tear o'er thee o'er thee and on her chilly brow again fell the warm tears like summer rain speak not of her unless thy voice can wake the dead and is that all your sages teach dionysius said to let oblivion's curtain fall upon the past and not regret the loved one gone but to forget forgetfulness i will not learn but carry to the silent urn the memory of the sleeper there yet learn the grief to calmly bear and from this sad this midnight hour i give to god my all of power my all of time ye stars above that seem to look with eyes of love upon a guilty world and thou foe though thou art attest my vow this is no time for secret faith when the fierce persecutor's scathe has swept so many down i go bearing within my heart a woe that neither distance time nor change can cure no country now 
no friend i have and lonely to the end must be my journey and my grave unknown as if in ocean's wave in years and feelings young but old in loneliness with griefs untold with joys unshared mid solitudes alone and in the city's crowds yet lonelier still the funeral pall upon the corpse the prison wall around the captive severing not more surely than my faith my lot but then when life is o'er the chain broken on earth will link again and brightly o'er my path of gloom breaks light immortal through the tomb vain dreams fond youth poetic dreams scattered and faint are all the beams that gleam upon the shades below whither departed spirits go the wisest live in doubt and die in gloomy dark uncertainty one hopes to reach the isles of bliss whose shores the stormless waters kiss where flowerets spring as soon as culled where by meandering rivers lulled all passions die and o'er the breast settles a calm ethereal rest a second thinks to wander back and in a different form to track a bright or darker path of life another hopes eternal sleep shall soul and body ever keep fast in its cold and lasting chains and wilt thou hades dark domains talk of rash youth as if to thee there were no land of mystery or like ulysses thou hadst trod the kingdom of the gloomy god thy fancy by thy passions fanned hath a strange scene of phantoms planned a union in the spirit's land and if beyond the grasp of time there be indeed such shadowy clime what right hast thou to enter there or she though once as he be fair tis for the brave the wise the great sages who smiled contempt at fate and heroes who have died to save the land that could but give a grave or those who touched the lyre and shrined in song the fantasies of mind but ye unknown to fame must die a common death like wild flowers lie cut by the mower purer far stoic than thou hast imaged are my hopes of bliss beyond the tomb it hath to me no cloud no gloom elysium not to thee is given by man aught like the christian's heaven and what does fancy give to thee fair land of ideality all that can charm the ear and eye but not the soul bright lakes that lie in the clear sunlight waves that die on golden sands whose melody mingles its murmurs with the tone of music that from earth hath gone these too may be in heaven but bliss pure and unchanging is not this but tis to feel for ever free from mortal taint it is to be made like her unto deity it is as endless years go round to search the depths of love profound hid in redemption's glorious plan or vast creation's works to scan and with unbaffled mind explore the universe from shore to shore it is to feel immortal love to all below to all above and with thyself to be at peace knowing the calm shall never cease askest thou what thought can cheer the gloom that darkens now the christian's doom what light yet lingers in his sky this hope of immortality End of part 16part 17 of dionysius the areopagite with other poems by anne hawkshaw this librivox recording is in the public domain dionysius the areopagite part 3 1 a generation died the sun in the bright heavens alone the same looked as when first our tale begun empires had passed and kings gone down to chambers where the only crown is worn by death and solitudes has started at new cities crowds the sapling had become a tree the child upon its mother's knee a man temples and creeds had changed 
Hearths had grown silent, friends estranged. Nature, it is but change, a power remodelling slowly, hour by hour, all things around. Nor man nor time can alter that decree sublime that naught shall waste. Earth shall not be less worthy of its deity, less fit for man, when in the skies for the last time yon sun shall rise, than now. Although the mountain range with ocean's bed its place may change, still on the shores the waves shall sweep until they utter wild and deep to earth and time their last farewell, sounding expiring nature's knell. No atom of primeval dust hath perished, though its form and place have changed a million times. In vain would fancy all its changes trace. The towers of ancient Babylon have crumbled, but no grain is gone. The hand of change, but not decay, hath given them back to native clay. The dew that fell on Eden's flowers may mingle with these seas of ours. Those thirty years, how like a dream to many a heart their flight would seem. The same in length, in change, in strife, the dreams of night and those of life, how like each other, good and ill, shadows and lights, commingling still. Back on the past with pensive pain we look, yet not to tread again the path of life desire. Ah, no, the happiest hearts too much of woe, the best too much of error know. And yet this space of dream-like date had been the minister of fate to kingdoms. To his righteous doom Nero had gone, but over Rome a deeper tyrant ruled, not slave of headlong passions, not the brave but hasty foe, but dark and cold, cast in humanity's worst mould, Domitian reigned. And Britain's isle, on which the Romans deemed the smile of day departed, thou my land, then bowed beneath a conqueror's hand. But he was mild in peace, as brave in war, and to the conquered gave the arts of life, nor taught in vain the arm he bound to loose its chain. But wherefore pause on history's page? The same dark story every age writes down in blood. First the rude home of savage life, with power to roam through unclaimed wilds, and then the strife for lands, for liberty, for life, with polished men, armed with the might which arts confer, but not with right. That is the savages, who sees the hut he built beneath those trees, whose boughs so long had o'er him grown, he thought they were indeed his own, fall by the stranger's axe. A race of aliens fill his dwelling place, like leaves swept by the autumn wind, the remnant of his race pass on, casting a wistful glance behind to scenes where all they loved is gone, and old familiar sounds have ceased, say not the sum of bliss increased, to others compensates for all the ills the savage may befall. Even were it so, eternal right is outraged, and for that alone there is no good that can atone. But tis not so, a withering blight, a curse from heaven pursues the deed. Doubt it, the Spaniards history read, and yet earth shrines their names who came o'er her fair scenes with sword and flame, making her Edens desolate. The spoilers whom mankind calls great, but finds no voice to tell of those who strove to heal her deepest woes, the woes of mind. A poet sung e'en a Domitian's praise, what tongue of bard, what tuneful lyre was strung, to tell of those who toiled to win a pagan world from woe and sin. They had no poet, had no page of earthly history, yet each age must be their debtor. For all time they laboured, and for every clime. They wrought a change no conqueror wrought. They taught what sages never taught. Mind feels the impulse still they gave, for they propelled its deepest wave. Sublime the themes they gave to mind, and pure the lessons taught mankind. The themes, 
a life beyond the tomb a day of audit and of doom when earth from all her thousand coasts shall call her sons and death his host shall render back to life all time centring in that one point each clime and race they knew alike to him who looks not at the hue or limb and these immortal truths they told to bond to free to young to old as shores seen o'er a misty sea glimpses of immortality had sages in their musings caught but there were minds too mean they thought and eyes too vulgar to be taught to lift their glance so high revealed in academic shades concealed in mystic forms was all they knew twas little and twas known to few they scorned the man who sought the shrine and deemed its deity divine they bowed with look as grave as he yet thought it an unentity the temple had no god the rite no meaning in the sage's sight the altar was a pile of stone they hailed an empty name alone look at the apostles turn to those who made almost a world their foes rather than hide one truth they knew o oh, dauntless hearts the firm and true theirs was a courage uninspired by praise by doubt and scorn untired earth has its mysteries and time its lengthened ages both sublime and the wide pathless sea and men who've searched these beyond the ken of others seeking nature's stores buried upon untrodden shores millions of years ago or swept as with an angel's wing through space and marked what suns and systems kept their vast and changeless round all these come out from dull mortalities sublime and noble but to stand alone amid a heathen land careless of scorn of chains of death to be unspotted when each breath lures with a siren's song to sin to stand those stately piles within where greece adored her gods and feel their beauty and their music steal upon the heart yet burst the spell and the stern solemn fact to tell that they were vanity and dust a broken reed on which to trust and not one humbling truth to hide in prejudice to human pride this is sublime beyond what earth can show tis not of earthly birth earth has its histories so hath heaven wherein are writ the deeds of men and actions up to motives traced by an impartial pen stripped of the tinsel and the gloss with which man strives to gild the dross there those who take a brother's life by slavery's woes or murder's knife are ranked together they who hold their fellows bound with those whose gold fits the fleet vessel to convey from afric's shores its human prey there to be good is great and not the accident of birth or lot genius is valued by its use wealth by the good it can induce the conqueror he who conquers self could but the history of one age be copied from that heavenly page how would it look by one of earth how each declare from whence its birth o oh, world so lovely yet so vile so beautiful with nature's smile so marred by man hast thou no spot that crime and sorrow visit not some little island of the blest some eden of the untrodden west no none where man hath been he reigns the savage o'er uncultured plains the oppressor or the oppressed he treads where art in vain his lustre sheds oh when shall war's dark flag be furled and love walk through a peaceful world when shall the murmurs of the sea the mountain wind the forest tree echo one sound all all are free and earth become one hallowed sod one mighty temple of her god end of part seventeen
Part 18 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dionysius the Areopagite, Part 3, 2. There was a cypress and a stone, o'er which had moss and ivy grown. A single lily of the vale, with its small blossoms pure and pale, quivered beside it in the gale and near it columns overthrown and fountain with wild flowers o'ergrown told that amid its gardens fair a stately mansion once stood there within whose halls had myra wept beneath that mossy stone she slept far from the land that gave them birth corinna lay in foreign earth where is her grave it is with things forgotten with the dust of kings the swords of heroes and their tombs beneath the city's silent domes none wept above it tis a spot unknown unthought of and forgot o'er it hath pealed the invader's blast o'er it have venging armies passed and ages in their silent tread have scattered o'er her lowly bed the dust of rome but myra laid where first in infancy she played her ashes from the italian shore her faithful slave to athens bore but she too died then all were gone who once had myra loved but one for thirty years the flowers had grown around that monumental stone each year they sprung and bloomed and faded emblems of whose tomb they shaded all sounds that told of life were gone the sudden fall of mouldering stone from ledge to ledge when winds were high the night birds wild and doleful cry these were the only sounds that woke the echoes there the silence broke lonely are afric's voiceless sands silent the arctic's frozen strands but earth has drearier scenes the spot once filled by man by man forgot awestruck the invaders paused when first Egypt's vast city on them burst, with temples silent as its dead, home of a hundred ages fled. It was a night of soft repose, such as those southern climes disclose when the wind scarcely shakes the rose that closed o'er Myra's silent bowers and shut that lily's spotless flowers. Its lengthened shadow o'er the grass the urn of parian marble threw and the night's melancholy flowers were glistening in the midnight dew when to that urn an old man came age had not bent his manly frame but toil or grief had left their trace in the deep furrows on his face and marked his brow with lines of care a while he stood in silence there and then with trembling hand withdrew the weeds that round the marble grew as if to read what name it kept then knelt beside the stone and wept i've seen an aged father weep beside his dying daughter's bed and bitterer seemed to me his tears than those our younger eyelids shed though age we feel should feel less pain parting to meet so soon again yet dionysius wept above the ashes of his first last love but how unlike those passionate tears shed on her brow in long past years when dying on his arm she lay fading in loveliness away they were but such as fill the eye when mournful music passes by or some fair scene or spoken words touch softly one of memory's chords and tears of tenderness will start fresh from the fountains of the heart he seemed to hear the very tones of the last words she said the strain of the last song he heard her sing seemed to come on the air again and memory pictured one by one words looks and scenes forever gone calling up beauty from the dust and the lyre's music from its rust but softening every tone and shade as scenes in distance softly fade he thought of her a happy child whose merry laugh so clear and wild rang through her father's halls 
whose feet went bounding through each green retreat, a butterfly of Kashmir's spring, mounting upon an untried wing. He saw her bending o'er her lyre in the first bloom of early youth, with eye all soul and heart all fire, dreaming that its romance was truth. Too soon, too soon, these dreams were broken, when once love's passionate words were spoken. Then the heart was itself no more, that shadow of a cloud came o'er her brow, and the long fringes hid the eye which drooped beneath its lid. In thought he saw her thus, to him more lovely than the laughing girl, standing beside the fountain's wave, to braid with flowers her brow of pearl. Quickly those scenes of memory passed, then came the tenderest and the last, when passing from the heart away, all it had loved or hoped or dreamed, in silence on her couch she lay. Her eyes, where no more lustre burned, to his in dying sadness turned. At length he spoke, The loved, the dead, alone are here, he calmly said. How are we changed? The marble's trust is only now a little dust, and I with time have nearly done. Mid darkening clouds, as setting sun, my lamp of life shall pass away. Thine darkened when it yet was day. Like visions, former scenes have passed and fleeted by, except the last. I did not think to find it thus. Dark ivy creeping round the stone, mid ruined halls and silent bowers. I am then in the world alone, the only one who thinks of thee. I breathe an unremembered name. O oh, time without eternity! O oh, life without the life above! What is there for the heart to love? End of Dionysius the Areopagite by Anne Hawkshaw Read by Phil Benson End of Part 18Part 19 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Notes to Dionysius the Areopagite. Note A. One shapeless mound alone is left. All that is left of Babylon is a collection of heaps which appear like natural hills, except that no green thing grows upon them until the excavations show that these heaps cover all that remains of the beauty of Chaldea's excellency. The principal mound is the Beers Nimrod, or Burnt Mountain, supposed to be the remains of the Temple of Belus. Note B. And Memnon's harp is silent now. To me there is something very beautiful in the fable of Memnon greeting the rising sun with joyful strains, and lamenting its setting with mournful ones. For how often do evening shades in sadness close, or hopes that with the morning rose? There are many statues that bear the name of Memnon, but that which was vocal is identified with the northernmost of the two colossal statues in the Theban plain, on the west bank of the Nile. The sounds are supposed to have been a device of the priests. Humboldt speaks of sounds that are heard at sunrise to proceed from rocks on the banks of the Orinoco, which he attributed to confined air making its escape through crevices and caverns, where the difference of the internal and external atmosphere is considerable. The French savants mention having heard similar sounds at Karnak, on the east bank of the Nile, and hence it is conjectured that the priests who had observed this phenomenon contrived either to cause similar sounds to be heard around the statue, or to magnify the natural murmuring of the winds into supernatural meaning. It is thought that the head of the colossal Memnon in the British Museum has no claim to be considered as the vocal Memnon of Strabo, Tacitus and Pausanias. See British Museum, Volume 1, page 266. Note C by white-robed druids to the sun. The worship of the heavenly bodies 
is the earliest form of superstition among all people but it is not improbable that the druids received the worship of baal or the sun from the phoenicians who traded to these islands after they formed their settlements in spain and who adored that deity with many cruel and bloody rites note d rise the green mounds of earlier time both in north and south america mounds of earth have been discovered which are supposed to be the work of a people anterior to the present indian race there are many of these remains on the banks of lake ontario some of which contain fragments of pottery penny cyclopedia article america note e through thee first came to europe's shores a saviour's name the first account we have of the preaching of the gospel in europe is in the acts chapter sixteen where st paul is said to have passed over from troas on the asian shore to philippi in greece note f where the cool sidness rolls its stream the waters of the sidness now called the tesource river are extremely cold caused by their combination with the melted snows from the ridges of mount taurus alexander the great nearly lost his life by injudiciously bathing in them tarsus the birthplace of st paul stands in a plain on the banks of the sidness it is still a town of some importance and was anciently one of the most important cities of asia minor it had a school for the study of philosophy and the arts according to strabo superior to those of athens and alexandria st paul speaking of his native place says he was a citizen of no mean city the lofty tomb of julian the apostate stood on the banks of the sidness c penny cyclopedia article silesia and gibbon volume four page two hundred and twenty four note g i stand amid a mingled crowd of men and gods it has been said that it was easier to find a god than a man in athens note h those scented bowers attica was famous for its aromatic plants note i the helmet of the goddess queen as far as sunium's cape was seen a bronze colossal statue of minerva the defender the work of phidias stood near the parthenon on the rock of acropolis the spear and helmet of this figure were seen towering above the surrounding heights in approaching athens by sea as soon as cape sunium was rounded see pausanias book one twenty eight note j young yet upon his youthful face deep thought had left its earnest trace in introducing dionysius here as young i would observe that i have not confined myself to his traditional history but simply to the scriptural account that he was converted to christianity by hearing st paul at athens note k dread power whate'er thou art that canst to winds and streams impart the voices of futurity the answers to some of the oracles were obtained by listening to the sound of the wind as it passed through the sacred groves or from the murmuring of running waters travels of anacarsis the younger abbe Barthélemy. note l share in the sad mother's fate niobe note m the watchdog still his station kept and by the threshold altar slept an altar dedicated to mercury and a watchdog were generally placed by the athenians at the door of their houses both were intended to guard against thieves note n but calm carinas found a tone in song the modern greeks frequently gave expression to their feelings in song when about to leave their country it is not unnatural therefore to suppose that their more poetical ancestors did the same note o spoils from the east spoils from the west the most remote countries of the ancient world were ransacked to supply the pomp of rome 
the forests of Scythia afforded valuable furs. Amber was brought overland from the shores of the Baltic to the Danube. There was a considerable demand for Babylonian carpets and other manufactures of the East, but the most important foreign trade was carried on with Arabia and India. Every year, about the summer solstice, a fleet of 120 vessels sailed from Mios Hormos, a port of Egypt on the Red Sea. The coast of Malabar, or the island of Ceylon, was the usual end of their navigation, and it was in these markets that the merchants from the more remote parts of Asia expected their arrival. The return of the fleet was in December or January, and as soon as their cargo had been transported on the backs of camels from the Red Sea to the Nile, and had descended that river as far as Alexandria, it was poured into the capital of the empire. The objects of oriental traffic were splendid and trifling. Silk, a pound of which was esteemed not inferior in value to a pound of gold, precious stones, and a variety of aromatics that were used in religious worship and in funerals. Fide Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Volume 1, Chapter 2, page 88. Note P. The city looked one funeral pile, seen o'er the plains for many a mile. This dreadful conflagration lasted for nine days and destroyed the greater part of the city. Upon its ruins Nero erected his celebrated golden palace, which seems to have been more remarkable for its vast extent and the richness of its materials than for the beauty of its architectural design. I have been guilty of an anachronism in the preceding page, in representing this palace as existing before the fire. Although the Christians had suffered insults and cruelty from outbreaks of popular fury, as in the case of Stephen at Jerusalem and of Paul at Lyconia, they did not experience a general persecution until the one under Nero, which took place in consequence of the fire in Rome. Note Q. Born mid Thessalian rocks. Thessaly was famous for its oracles. Its inhabitants were much addicted to witchcraft and other superstitions. Note R. Tis for the brave, the wise, the great. In the Elysium of the Ancients, we find none but heroes and persons who had either been fortunate or distinguished on earth. The children, and apparently the slaves and lower classes, that is to say, poverty, misfortune and innocence, were banished to the infernal regions. Chateaubriand, Génie du Christianisme. Note S. But he was mild in peace, as brave in war. Gnaeus Julius Agricola. At the close of the campaign in which Agricola defeated the Britons under Galgacus, on the Grampian Hills, a Roman fleet, for the first time, sailed round Britain, as if to mark the extended boundary of the Roman Empire. See Penny Cyclopedia, Article Agricola. Note T. A poet sung in a Domitian's praise. The poet Stasius dedicated to Domitian his Thebaeus and Achilleus and commemorated the events of his reign in his Sylvae. Note you, awestruck, the invaders paused. It is said the whole French army, when in Egypt, made an involuntary halt when they came in sight of the ruins of Thebes. End of part 19Part 20 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Past 1. Where is the record of the past inscribed, and where the chronicle of ages gone? What is the gift with which great time was bribed to spare the tablets it is writ upon? Hold the dark pyramids, the mystic scroll, do the pale genie of departed years, in sunless caverns as the centuries roll, record the sum of human hopes and fears? 2. No, 
the past writes its history everywhere on the dark mountain in the savage glen man treads no spot however lone but there he finds memorials of his fellow men or nature's history of an elder time the past tis written on the human heart told by tradition's tongue from clime to clime heard in the speech of many a busy mart three what gave the grecian his immortal theme what gave to tasso his undying lay the past whose dim rememberings like a dream were fading in obscurity away they heard the voices of departed time and gave them to the future pausing oft as many a vision rose of blood and crime or woman's gentle tones in pleading accents soft Four. the present age shall be the theme of song to future ages when the mists of time have softened down the outline now too strong making the dim and shadowy seem sublime and as the walls of many a ruined pile outlast the lovelier but the frailer part the daring deed survives though dark and vile the gentler feelings of the human heart five the nations of the past where are they now some with the cities which they built decayed some died away we know not why or how their fated hour arrived though long delayed one only hath it given us still unchanged the dweller of the desert is the same kingdoms have changed around him since he ranged across arabia's sands and bore the robber's name Six cities sprung round him but he turned away armies enclosed him but he mocked their might empires arose he bowed not to their sway art spread her works he heeded not the sight his vices and his virtues all his own he gives not borrows not from polished men his home the desert and a tent his throne his grave the cavern or the mountain glen Seven the cities of the past they stand alone fast and majestic in their slow decay year after year but crumbles down a stone and ages watch them as they pass away some have outlived their name and some their date like tombs recording not whose dust they shrined while unto others time a different fate hath given their name alone remains behind Eight a heap of ruins only marks the spot where once the ephesians splendid city stood the very sea hath now its shores forgot and dread malaria broods where once the flood brought asia's riches to those marble streets one pillar in its solitude sublime alone upon the plain of sardis meets the stranger's gaze a beacon left by time Nine oh let those silent cities still remain untouched unmarred by things of present date let the old temple on its native plain there meet the slow arrival of its fate drag not the shattered capital away the shaftless base to mingle in our halls with things that speak but of the present day no let them moulder by their ancient walls Ten the cities of the past some stand apart in solitudes unbroken by the sound of even the beating of a human heart a silence as the very graves profound some hath the earth entombed and some the sea deep in her forests some hath nature hid and in the western world the tropic tree waves beside many a nameless pyramid Eleven like spellbound giants of an earlier day enchanted in their vast and silent halls the egyptian statues watch their shrines decay where not a flower smiles on the sun-scorched walls the burning wind that sweeps the desert sand and strews it round until it heaps their tomb sighs like a dirge around them as they stand waiting the slow approaches of their doom Twelve it is not so with thee immortal greece thy statues hail not in their native land the olive springing by the shrine of peace and freedom's lamp relighted on thy strand 
they fled thy coasts when anarchy and crime and long oppression bowed thee to the dust to waken genius in our colder clime be what thou wert again and we resign our trust thirteen beyond the past in science we have gone but not in art those antique statues stand like beings of another race alone amid the grand around them yet more grand amid the beautiful the loveliest still we gaze and fancy that the god will speak the nymph step from her marble pedestal oh move not breathe not or the spell will break fourteen we have not learned to love the beautiful as grecians loved it as a childish play though still the earth of loveliness is full we deem such feeling in our wiser day is it an idle play when he who spread the vault of heaven gave it a thousand hues and strewed the very ground on which we tread with tinted cups to hold the evening dews fifteen the pencil and the lyre both live and die with the deep earnest love of what is fair they give the past an immortality but of that glory shall the present share or must we link their names with days gone by oh never let it be the poet's lyre hath mourned his country with a patriot's sigh hath roused to energy a nation's fire sixteen what first shook europe from her death-like trance her long dark night of ignorance and crime dante's stern thought and petrarch's eloquence breathed in the music of italian rhyme they woke the memory of departed things pointing to relics of the ages gone and long as freedom loves the lyre's deep strings will she remember him of avignon seventeen harp of my country left in silence now thy tones have roused thy sons in other days when cambria gathered on the mountain's brow freedom's last hosts who answered to thy lays the voice of freedom ceased not till the tone of thy last harp was silenced would the strain that roused thy children in the ages gone might echo through their island home again eighteen though not to bid them quell a foreign foe but wake the love of country in their breast for in the crowded street the voice of woe the low faint cry of poverty oppressed sounds like the requiem of my country's peace the dirge for her long day of glory fled harp of my country waken ere it cease and the last spirit of the land be dead nineteen the songs of other days they linger still in ancient legends and in antique rhymes nor has the heart which loves yet ceased to thrill at thy sad songs thou bard of troubled times who breathe thy numbers o'er the lost ones urn e'en from the loneliness of our dark towers how oft in those long years wouldst thou return in hope and memory to thy southern bowers twenty those sweet but mournful songs thy country shrines amidst her choicest treasures of the past and round thy princely brow the laurel twines son of orleans while his is withering fast who gave thee in this land an exile's doom for thee the child of song shall breathe the strain while history gives to decorate his tomb the conqueror's bloody wreath the persecutor's chain twenty one where sleep the bards go ask tradition's tale the historic page records not how they lie the crested helm the lance the coat of mail on stately cenotaphs attract the eye beneath the arches of the gothic pile but lowly are the tombs which bear the lyre in the old temple of our native isle his name has perished of our song the sire twenty two the past it is a thing on which to pause a name breathed softly as that word farewell a theme to muse on at the evening's close when best on solemn thoughts the heart will dwell tis like a land of which we oft have heard yet seen of its far-stretching shores but part 
yet on that little portion are interred how many hopes and loves alas how many a heart twenty three still in that land each one an interest hath an atom of the whole yet more to him in thought to tread some old familiar path than the long tracks with shadowy distance dim tis more to him that tangled briars creep upon those walls where rose and jessamine grew where a kind mother watched his infant sleep than that the hand of time palmyra's halls or through twenty four the flight of years change not our hearths alone far more they change ourselves we never meet as last we parted voices lose their tone bright eyes grow dim and hearts less lightly beat the smile of childhood and the hopeful brow of youthful beauty change to pensive grace and quiet thought as sunny beams endow the skies with softened tints before they leave their place twenty five in form in heart in mind the past hath brought a change to all we love to all we know for good or evil only hath it wrought a blessing or a curse it must bestow have all the sorrows all the griefs the tears that we have seen but made us feel the less for human woe or has the lapse of years softened the heart to tenfold tenderness twenty six and have the wonders of creation woke of adoration not a loftier strain as one by one upon the mind they've broke and yet are moving on an endless train if when a child thine eye was raised above in wonder to the god who spread the sky with sparkling gems how deep thine awe and love who knowest them now as worlds and suns on high twenty seven let not the simple homage of the child condemn the heartless worship of the man nature to it was mystic strange and wild to thee tis full of wonders yet of plan it looked above around and sky and earth alike were beautiful it knew no more but hushed the throbbings of its infant mirth to bless its god oh how shouldst thou adore twenty eight men count the past by years or months or days while history notes it by the ages sped but science far beyond extends her gaze and reckons by her mighty cycles fled the deeds which history calls of ancient date she numbers with the things of yesterday one stops to mark the ruined city's fate the other tells of systems passed away twenty nine the historic muse points to the roofless hall the lonely pillar or the sculptured shrine where silently the feet of centuries fall and the green branches of the ivy twine where in the midnight hour the owlet moans and autumn gales strew round the withered flowers and winter sighs with deeper sadder tones and the pale blossom spring plants on the mossy towers thirty these are the chronicles of empires past the work of hands now mouldered to decay strewing the earth but things more strange and vast nature entombed long ere these passed away with skill beyond the sculptors graved their forms upon the enduring rock and left them there nor did the beating of ten thousand storms those records of an elder world impair thirty one but pause not there still further backward turn before that time perchance bright suns had set no more in their far distant skies to burn whose scattered light hath never reached us yet think of the hour when they began their course and rose in silent grandeur to the sky then pause and of the past be that the source time stretches not beyond there is eternity footnotes stanza nineteen nor has the heart which loves yet ceased to thrill at thy sad songs thou bard of troubled times the duke of orleans 
who was taken prisoner at the Battle of Agincourt by Henry V, and kept a prisoner in this country twenty-three years, chiefly in the Tower, where he composed some of his most beautiful poems. Stanza 21 In the old temple of our native isle, his name has perished, of our song the sire. A few years since, I saw the tomb of Chaucer in Westminster Abbey, with no inscription except Chaucer, written with chalk. End of part 20Part 21 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Future 1. Who shall unveil the future? Who unfold the fate of systems, empires, and of man? Ceased is the voice of prophecy of old, and dim the eyes which once its glooms could scan. The prophet's harp is silent as his tongue, Both rest together by Judea's streams, Land of the loftiest and the holiest song, Land of a scattered people's hopes and dreams. 2. Who shall unfold the future? Man hath sought to pierce its mystic shade in every age, For this, with ceaseless toil and patient thought, Watched on Chaldea's plains the hoary sage his book of destiny, the midnight sky, and each bright planet in its ceaseless course, the silent messenger of fate on high, alike unbribed by gifts, unawed by force. 3. For this, in Libyan deserts rose the shrine, and in the Delphian shade the Pythia stood. For this, the Sibyl breathed the mystic line, and the pale priestess in the Grecian wood Listen to the murmurings of the southern wind Through the dim pine grove by the sacred streams. Nor strange if in their tones such hearts could find The voice of coming years, like music heard in dreams. 4. Each one is his own prophet, and each heart a shrine Where many a warning voice is spoken, And visions glide which make the gazer start, And vows are uttered, which too soon are broken. To some the voice of hope, so glad and wild, alone gives answers at that secret shrine, while others by her tones are ne'er beguiled. They hear but melancholy's mournful line. 5. We read the future's history in the past. Cities have perished, empires died away, and human schools and systems found at last they held the seeds of premature decay, what air of truth each system had endures the rest is gone and in a coming age false shall our falsehood seem for time ensures the life of truth alone not dogmas of the sage six this cheered galileo in his dungeon cell and the great bard when blind despised and old gleams from the future or his harp-strings fell Voices of distant ages round them rolled. The future renders justice to the past, And in her hands they calmly left their fame. On coming years a glance prophetic cast To live in them the lofty hope and aim. 7. The cities of the future shall they rise Mid the untrodden forests of the west, Or where the coral isle in beauty lies Upon the southern ocean's Asia breast? or far away on undiscovered shores, by unknown oceans washed and nameless streams, where nature watches by her unseen stores of bird and flower and tree. Who, who shall read such dreams? 8. And who shall tell thy fate, my native land? Who could have guessed it, when on Thanet's shore he saw the stranger Hengis faithless band? and the rude barks our circling ocean bore. Not even thou, immortal Alfred, thou, the king at once in heart and mind and face. Would that the diadem had decked thy brow in England's brighter day, pride of thy Saxon race. 9. Though every state, my country, thou hast passed, conquered, oppressed, and then in freedom risen, and arts and power, 
and must this be thy last art thou too doomed to fall forbid it heaven for thee how many a noble heart has bled how many a patriot voice hath wished thee well be thou perpetual the venetian said when on his dying couch yet venice fell ten but thou shalt be perpetual if thy guide be sacred virtue and if justice sway the counsels of thy land and power and pride crush not the millions who thy rule obey let ocean whelm thee in her deepest caves let the white billow sweep the cultured plain rather than freedom's children sink to slaves or bind round others the oppressor's chain eleven the day-star of earth's freedom has arisen amid the islands of the western main a glimmering ray hath reached the captive's prison and slavery trembles while he locks the chain brightly it gilds the palm groves of the west slowly yet surely shall it mount the sky till every clime its noontide beams hath blessed and one glad sound be heard the song of liberty twelve nor shalt thou be forgotten captive land whose silent plains the kingly minstrel trod upon those shores again thy sons shall stand where bard and prophets swept their harps to god where are judea's children ask the wind that sighs a requiem o'er siberia's snow question the city mid the oasis shrined or ask the billows round the world that flow thirteen all all shall answer here the lonely child of wasted judea finds an outcast's home there is no race the polished or the wild earth has no shore that's washed by ocean's foam but there he dwells yet ever dwells alone nor is that land a fatherland to him judea's lonely wastes and piles of stone he calls his native clime captive in heart and limb fourteen still in the portico of wisdom's hall stand the high spirits of the present day the distant sounds of truths around them fall and from the interior comes a glimmering ray revealing yet half hiding glorious scenes for coming ages and for other minds and they shall tread the part which intervenes it with the future thus the present binds fifteen much hath been done yet little hath been done what know we even of the earth we tread what spicy veils beneath a tropic sun in unseen loveliness their beauties spread what unknown forms of life may rove the wood or skim the waters of that distant land round which the vast pacific rolls its flood where england's sons as exiled outcasts stand sixteen around above beneath us there are themes we know not of for science and for art and wild imagination's wildest dreams pine not for these for we have had our part we give the coming years what may remain a gift more glorious than the past bequeaths we leave them untouched wonders nature's reign it's left us ruins twined with laurel wreaths seventeen greatest of all we leave the fate of man the destiny of mind what shall it be for it was woven nature's mighty plan spirit that breathes of immortality shall it advance as future years advance deeper and broader loftier be its range or shall it sink again in death-like trance from gloom to darker gloom its only change eighteen no the great nations of the present day may cease to be the learned and the wise but not for that shall knowledge quench its ray its light on other climes and realms shall rise its home may change and science build a shrine in lonely islands of the distant sea or where round grecian fanes the ivy twines but stop it cannot tis for ever free nineteen how can it pause it was not made to rest in a dull quietude which is not bliss like forest circled lake whose sunless breast no tempests sweep no summer breezes kiss for ever and for ever journeying on 
regretting not what it hath left behind for higher themes still may it dwell upon this is the lofty destiny of mind twenty through the long circle of six thousand years it hath been busy for in eden's bowers it woke ere yet the first sad human tears fell withering on their amaranthine flowers enough it had e'en then to fill its range in the fair universe itself and god yet for a new-made world would we not change this earth by many generations trod twenty one more themes for thought each century will give and future ages of our own will learn long as the heaven enkindled flame shall live and spirits with immortal fire shall burn these themes shall never fail for he who made this restless busy mind before its gaze can spread new wonders not to us displayed in evening dewdrops or in morning rays twenty two nought is exhausted like a history read from the torn fragments of an ancient scroll we learn earth's history in the epochs fled the future may the mighty whole unroll nations have left in hieroglyphic forms their archives graven on the sculptured walls but coming men shall tread those silent homes and pierce the mystery which around them falls twenty three like him who by the founts of nilus stood in afric's solitudes unknown to men and felt while gazing on that infant flood all his long toil was compensated then yet as to him amid his pride there came visions of home by distant scotia's streams the love of country with the thought of fame shall mingle still in many a wanderer's dreams twenty four oh there are earnest longings in the heart to pierce yet further through the mystic shades which hide the works of god in every part for silent mystery all around pervades divide the mass to atoms trace the cause still backward through an ever lengthening chain there is a point at which at length we pause and where the loftiest spirits still remain twenty five had he who plucked the lightning's fiery wing and stayed the thunder on its cloudy throne some high yet undefined imagining of the strange wonders that of it are known scarce deem we spirit is a mystery now when there is something which pervades all space and yet unseen and noiselessly doth flow but once unchained would overwhelm our race twenty six the mystery of life may it be solved shall future ages know the force the power hidden in human frames whence it's evolved from what mysterious cause and shall an hour the triumph of long years of anxious thought dawn on some lonely sage in coming time and prove the long-sought truth one glance thus caught were worth those years of toil that moment were sublime twenty seven for tis not by the length of years alone that we should value life are there not those whose minds have moved to one unvarying tone a long dull cadence without change or pause while there are spirits who in one short hour will live such sleepers mental life of years better sometimes to feel excitement's power although its smiles are not unmixed with tears twenty eight science hath much to teach to future time but other lessons still it hath to learn lessons than hers more solemn and sublime to which the spirit would do well to turn the good may be forgotten in the great the moral in the mental and the hand who built and furnished all this fair estate be unremembered mid the works he planned twenty nine let memory take the past we give to hope the future with its store of radiant things bright as the tints of heaven's ethereal cope she stretches to it her immortal wings and yet some think she should survey its shore so dimly seen but with an anxious glance for vain alike is wisdom's treasured store or her gay dreams to pierce its vast expanse 
30. We stand like those who on the new world shore watched for the mists of night to pass away. Behind them rolled wide oceans voyaged o'er, before an unknown land in darkness lay, while, as they gazed upon that summer isle, the morning broke. O'er palm groves rose the sun, and thus we greet the future with a smile. We see its dawn, and then our task is done. Footnotes Stanza 3 for this in Libyan deserts rose the shrine, the temple of Jupiter Ammon. Stanza 23. Like him who from the founts of Nilus stood. Bruce. Stanza 25. Had he who plucked the lightning's fiery wing. Franklin. End of part 21. Part 22 of Dionysius the Areopagite with other poems by Anne Hawkshaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wildflowers. 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 Ye are sweeter far than the garden's prouder beauties are. Kissed by the sun, fanned by the wind, blooming and blushing all unconfined wet with the shower of the early spring, brushed by the butterfly's wandering wing, lulled by the bee in the noontide hours, are ye in your lonely retreats, wild flowers. Ye are born in the depths of the mountain glen, far from the noisy haunts of men, bathed with the spray of the wild cascade, deep mid the gloom of the forest shade, nursed with alpine steeps of snow above, and the Leman Lake below, where the chamois bounds untamed and free, and the winds are the breath of liberty. Like banners ye wave on the ruined tower, like gems ye are scattered round beauty's bower, ye are decking the martyr's lowly grave, ye bend o'er the desert fountain's wave, where the foot of man hath never trod on the secret altars of nature's God. By the mighty Jumna's hidden springs, Ye sleep in beauty, ye fair wild things. Oh, that I had a home like yours, As once I had, ye sweet wild flowers. For the wild bird's song, and the breeze's sigh, And the lulling sound of waters nigh, And autumn's tones, so deep and wild, A music and song to nature's child. And far away I long to be, From crowded cities, alone with ye. THE WELSH BARD'S LAST SONG My hand is on my harp, I'll wake it once again, Wake it, and pour one last wild song, Then snap its chords in twain. Harp, thou hast roused the brave, Hast nerved the coward's hand, and never shall thy numbers sound but in a free man's land. Spirit of other days, let visions of the past float o'er yon dusky mountain's brow, let voices on the blast. Tell me of other times and ages that are fled, let me hold converse with the shades of bards and warriors dead. Let me forget I live degenerate and a slave, or let me find mid yonder rocks a free, unconquered grave. My spirit could not rest, If o'er the minstrel's head, The foeman's hostile band should pass, The tyrant's footsteps tread. But let the mountain goat, The tameless and the wild, Bound o'er the last and narrow home Of freedom's child. Spring to the flowers, To the primrose, Primrose bud, be thou the child Of the woodland thicket and dingle wild. Spring by the fountain's dashing wave, Smile on the infant's lowly grave. Peep by the peasant's cottage gate, Be the violet's friend and the cowslip's mate. To the daisy. Daisy, not of my train art thou. I see thee on summer's burning brow, In the glowing wreath that autumn wears, In the withered crown that winter bears. Go, wander, unconstrained and free, 
in every place thy home shall be on mount and moorland rock and tower in woodland lone and cultured bower to the lily of the valley far from the homes of men away far from the summer's scorching ray by the lonely stream and the forest tree lily of beauty thy home must be emblem of purity shroud thee well in the glossy leaves of thine emerald cell thy head shall bend with the breath of spring and quiver and shake at the wild bird's wing lonely thy home but the young and fair led by thy perfume shall seek thee there to the water lily where the crystal wave neath sunny skies calm as a glassy mirror lies or far mid the mountain solitudes where the kingly eagle proudly broods and the lakes their secret hollows lie unseen by all save the kingbird's eye floating upon that wave at rest stirred as the water bird leaves its nest there is the home i give to thee queen of the lonely lake to be sonnet to america queen of the western world upon thy brow there is a spot of blood a crimson stain that dims thy greatness and it is in vain thy snowy sail on every sea to show or through thy streets that streams of commerce flow or that thy cities rise on every plain though thou art loud when freedom is the strain yet thou to heaven preferst a faithless vow think not thy brightest deeds will weave a veil to hide from god or man thy one great crime wrongs that will turn the cheek of pity pale history shall write of thee in after time and future ages on one page shall see the slave's unheeded prayer the song of liberty palestine is this judea this the promised land where conquering joshua led his hebrew band is this the clime that flowed with oil and wine this lonely waste can this be palestine yes even so for he who cannot lie whose word must stand though sons and systems die to prophet bards and holy seers of old the scroll of dark prophetic lore unrolled their lips foretold and firm the word remains and silent horror broods o'er all her plains the heathen gentiles in her cities tread the thistle waves above her kingly dead no olive springs upon its favourite hill nor lily bends by cool siloam's rill on carmel's mount on tabor's sacred height no beams of glory strike the astonished sight as wont of old when seraphs wandered there and angel harpings floated on the air the prostrate pillar and the moss-grown stone where lizards creep and birds unholy moan where roofless halls are filled with drifting sand these are the cities of that sinful land yes for her sins and for her sins alone the locks of glory from her head were shorn for this the rose from sharon's field is gone nor cedar forest wave or lebanon for this in judea's vales the harp and lute and minstrel song and voice of mirth are mute for this in every clime in every land from russia's snows to afric's burning sand a weary worn and persecuted race her children seek in vain a resting place ages have passed yet still their heart remains dark and unfruitful as their native plains land of my fathers land of my fathers isle of the free go look ye abroad o'er land and sea on the glowing east on the distant west on the islands that lie on ocean's breast basking in sunlight and gemmed with flowers they are not fair like this isle of ours homes of beauty it has that sleep in quiet peace in its valleys deep wealth it has and the sunbeams fall on many a palace and gilded hall and its vessels float on every tide but it is not these that make its pride no land of my fathers but tis thou art free 
free as the wave that encircles thee free as the winds that rock to rest the eagle upon his mountain nest thou hast broken the fetter and burst the chain a slave cannot breathe in thy wide domain to fountains abbey it is a common record thy hoary ruins bear and yet thy vaults are eloquent though silence self be there a tale of glory gone of splendour passed away of pomp like youthful hopes and loves changed for decay where are the hands that reared thee thou ivy-mantled pile where are the tongues that breathed the hymn down thy long pillared aisle ask not the now deserted shrines who bent the suppliant knee ask not tradition's thousand tales but ask eternity not one of all who in thy courts from age to age have trod can rest as thou ere long shalt rest for ever neath the sod in all the proudest works of man the seeds of death are shrined but immortality has stamped the seal of life on mind i sigh to think thy walls shall live soon but in history's page though child of superstition thou reared in a darksome age more beautiful in slow decay thy mouldering halls to me than when a hundred torches gleamed on monkish pageantry to a bereaved father weep for the silent grave hath closed above thy son weep yet rejoice for hath not he the crown of conquest won born from the treacherous river's breast on heaven's unchanging shore to rest plant on his youthful grave the blossoms of the spring the bending lily pale and pure bring from the valleys bring and on his ashes let them be the types of immortality for as returning spring shall wake their flowers again so shall his slumbering body break mortality's cold chain when the last beams of yonder sun shall dimly tell his work is done and ere that glorious day safe from the storms of time with rapture shall his spirit greet thee to the blessed clime he is but gone a while before to hail thy coming to that shore the exile song i live upon the memory of the past of the clear fountains and the woodland streams oh that their pleasant harmonies would last that murmur still like music through my dreams for mid the crowded city and its throng of busy men what hath the child of song there is a voice a deep and meaning tone when through the pine wood sweeps the winter's blast and there are visions in the clouds that throne themselves on rocks when storms are gathering fast and the white avalanche prepares to leap down the valley from its alpine steep give me for home the mountain and the wild there's health and freedom in its roughest gale this is no home for inspiration's child amid the crowd with toil and commerce pale and these dark heavy piles which their coarse dreams embody forth give me my own bright streams give me the works of god or if of men let it be those who inspiration drew from the deep solemn gloom of wood and glen and copied nature to their model true and loved to turn from their own works to trace the purer forms from whence they caught their grace and give me nature's sounds can music's tones fashioned by art such thrilling feelings bring as when throughout the caverns fretted stones the low deep waters and the breezes sing or when across the wild and sullen sky and leafless wastes the autumnal gale sweeps by mysterious ocean in thy ceaseless roar there is a strange music of unearthly power as one long billow chases to the shore its dying fellow in the midnight hour thine is a deeper voice than gothic pile from solemn organ sends down its long pillared isle keep keep my heart 
the treasures which thou hast of sounds and scenes that now have passed away things far too beautiful on earth to last earth that but holds her treasures for decay and let soft voices of the woods and streams come floating round me though but in my dreams the mother to her starving child oh sleep i dread to see those eyes to mine in silent grief appealing sleep and i will not breathe a sigh though down my cheeks the tears are stealing my breaking heart be still a while he sleeps and i may almost smile i might have borne it if disease had changed thee thus and only wept as others oft have wept before and in my heart thy memory kept and treasured there like parting token each lisped word that thou hast spoken i should have dreamed of thee by night a blessed thing with wings of light i should have thought of thee by day and all that thou wouldst do or say i should have heard the very tone of thy soft voice in every sound then wept to know myself alone and thou beneath the churchyard ground but they had only been such tears as memory keeps for bygone years softening the heart like summer showers that bend but do not break its flowers but now my tears for thee will fall like burning drops to scorch my heart fancy nor memory ere recall my child why how we part there was a sound long years ago by rachel's grave a voice was heard in rama twas a cry of woe from mother's hearts to madness stirred a sorrow that refused relief and such ay such will be my grief to on the death of three of her children i do not know thee but one kindred tie binds us together though my name may wake no gentle memories of the days gone by yet if the bard and soldier for the sake of lyre and sword are brothers i may dew thy children's grave with tears i am a mother too oh name most sainted of the names of earth none but a mother knows what mothers feel when the clear voice is hushed of childhood's mirth and on the laughing eyes death puts his seal a sound of music from the earth is gone nor art nor nature can give back the tone but the heart hears it in the sleepless night and dreams give back the soft familiar tread oh cease deceiving fantasies the light must wake the weeping mother to her dead or bring them with angelic pinions by painting them as they are where they can never die through the dim shadowy land of death they've passed to homes of brightness and to bowers of rest but we on earth have still to look our last the dying pillow still hath to be pressed. Oh, weep not for the dead, but weep for those whose eyes have yet in death's dark sleep to close. To, after the death of her daughter. Oh, tell me not the loved and lost forget that heavenly hearts no earthly love can hold hath dark oblivion there its signet set and can the feelings as the grave be cold pure and allied to heaven they are by birth shrined first in forms that trod a sinless earth say thou who weeping o'er a daughter's dust liftest from thence the eye of faith above how sweet the confidence how firm the trust that still she treasures thoughts of thee with love and through the azure of the upper skies looks down on those she loved with calm and happy eyes we have our loved ones in those brighter skies nor can they seem a stranger's clime to be religion time and death unloose the ties of earth to link them to eternity the heart's affections with unbroken chain 
bind those whom earth has lost with those who yet remain lines on a friend lost at sea art thou too gone the loved the kind the young and do the breezes o'er thy place of death sigh with their wild and melancholy song as if thy voice still mingled with their breath art thou too gone and does the ocean wave roll with its dirge-like music o'er thy grave it seems but yesterday since last we met when youth's bright hopes and generous thoughts were thine and more than these thy youthful heart had beat in pure devotion at religion's shrine those hopes and thoughts thou hast engulfed dark sea they rest among thy treasures but in thee are no wrecked hopes of immortality no from the stormy wave the spirit bore its holy breathings and its lofty trust and only left amid the billow's roar the solid things of earthliness and dust rising immortal from the ocean's foam to amaranthine bowers an everlasting home lost did they say thou wert yes lost to earth that hath such need of holy ones like thee lost to the lovely spot that gave thee birth its ancient woods with solemn melody waving around its gothic towers retain no echo of thy voice tis now a bygone strain but not a memory lost kind hearts will hold thine image midst the treasures which they keep of scenes beloved they shall no more behold of voices hushed in silence eyes that sleep in death's dark slumber bright hopes passed away and all they loved now yielded to decay nor lost to heaven endowed with angel powers thy mind creation's glorious work shall scan and watch till time shall close his finished hours the ways of god the destinies of man what is earth's boasted wisdom now to thee amid the wonders of eternity the prophet's lament and jeremiah lamented for josiah two chronicles chapter thirty five verse twenty five weep lonely daughter of judea weep bow widowed queen thy faint and crownless head among the tombs thy midnight vigils keep wail mid the chambers of thy mighty dead raise not thine eyes they shall but view afar chaldea's eagles gathering to the war i hear a voice upon the tempest blast my spirit trembles at the dreary sound bow to the dust thy cedars lebanon great ocean hide thee in thy depths profound earth cast away thy gorgeous robes and sigh and be thou clothed in sackcloth orient sky i hear that sound for ever in the wind and in the dashing waters troubled roar in the deep thunder in the desert's blast in the wild billows on the lonely shore it is a spirit's voice that speaks in all storms winds and waters of my country's fall and by my couch at midnight visions pass of coming years and shadowy figures creep in dim uncertain gloom yet with a sound that gathers as they come then onward sweep chaldea's hosts and pomp and pride are there and judah's captives in their mute despair i see the temple on moriah's brow our holy house by heathen conquerors trod i see their ensigns waving in the wind e'en on the altars of judea's god our father's sepulchres in ruins laid and night birds gathering where our prophets prayed let clouds and darkness on megiddo's plain rest now for ever let not there the sound of pleasant music or the voice of song or hum of busy men henceforth resound for there josiah mid the heathen died there sunk in dust our buckler and our pride song though a smile is on my lip and my words are light and free yet my heart unchanging still thinks 
ever thinks of thee between us ocean rolls and years must intervene ere thou canst tread with me again each loved familiar scene but time with chilly hand can never sweep away the records traced on memory's page of many a happier day this throbbing anxious heart cold in the tomb must be ere i can tear thine image thence and cease to think of thee the greek girl song fling on oblivion's wave my own my sunny clime the records of thy history that tell of bonds and crime dark was the night of slavery at length awoke the spirit that had slumbered long and all thy fetters broke that spirit which had nerved the bosoms of our sires had edged the patriot warrior's sword or tuned the minstrel's lyres the fields where those who fell for greece in other days the songs of those who told their deeds in wild poetic lays kept living though for centuries it vain and dimly burned the flame of sacred liberty till brighter days returned for who of thy degenerate sons could look on marathon or tread thy pass thermopylae nor think of glory gone but now around the hero's brow let grecian maidens twine the laurel that for ages past but decked the ruined shrine and let the voice of song be heard o'er the blue aegean sea waken again the doric lute for greece is free the captive king two kings chapter twenty five long years long years ago upon this furrowed brow glittered the circlet of a realm where is it now where is it on the head of him who bound this chain around these limbs and slew my sons on ribla's fatal plain my sons i saw them die and then they steeped in night these eyes that pity might have closed before the horrid sight and now in darkness laid shut in this living tomb by day by night i picture still my children's bloody doom long years long years have passed i'll number up the sum yet no to darkness let them pass as darkly they have come long years yet still i live within my prison wall ah would that this might be the last to break the captive's thrall the strong in manhood's eager strife have paused and passed away and beauty in the grave has found the chambers of decay yet still i live though bowed with age blind wretched and alone death hast thou too forgotten me here on this dungeon stone why am i a slave one poor wretch died there isle of france broken-hearted constantly exclaiming why am i a slave bennett and tyerman's voyage around the world why do i bear that cursed name why why am i a slave why doomed to drag a wretched life in sorrow to the grave born mid the mountain solitudes and as the lion free who had a right to bind these limbs and make a slave of me i looked there stood the white man's home mid pleasant founts and flowers mid waving woods and waters clear green vines and rosy bowers it had an air of loveliness that suited not despair i turned away for well i knew that happy hearts were there i knew that happy hearts were there for voices full of glee came on the air and from their tone i knew that they were free and like the low faint murmuring sound that marks the wretched slave words rung from misery's quivering lips that sound as from the grave i turned there stood my lonely hut i call it not my home for no beloved face is there and no familiar form no voice to break its solitude and none to soothe the woe of him who was but born to sigh 
whose tears must ever flow why does the rose bestrew his path and mine the pricking thorn why was the white man born to smile and i to sigh and mourn i know not only this i know till in the silent grave there is no hope no joy for me i am a slave a slave sonnet to i love my country for i love my kind man is my brother wheresoe'er he roam i love my father's hearth my childhood's home and all the hopes and memories round it twined i love the deep thoughts and the cares which bind the mother to her children in my heart these and the love of song have each their part but not a part for thee alone i find for tis all thine as light that fills no space and yet pervades all nature and which gives all forms their beauty loveliness and grace and energy and hope to all that lives so unto me hath been thy love then take this song of mine and keep it for my sake end of section twenty two end of dionysius the areopagite with other poems by anne hawkshaw read by phil benson